Okay, cool. Okay, so we are going to talk about computation and memory today and tomorrow. Uh, let's see how far we can get. Since this is a, a really fascinating area today, and it's really important going forward, we'll dedicate at least two lectures, uh, but we will see if we can be done uh, by tomorrow. And uh, some part of this lecture will be familiar because uh, we've covered trends affecting main memory. I'm gonna remind you some of them. Uh, and then uh, if, if uh, we have motivated the need for intelligent memory controllers in the past few lectures, actually, especially from the bottom up perspective, if you remember, we talked about a lot of memory scaling issues, reliability issues uh, like refresh, row hammer, and other reliability problems that we didn't go into a lot of detail into, but essentially we're having a lot of difficulty scaling uh, main memory, uh, including DRAM. Uh, well, DRAM is a major part of main memory today. Uh, and this scaling issues are causing problems uh, that I call as push from circuits and devices. Basically, there's a push from circuits and devices uh, that essentially would uh, are, are pushing us to have more intelligent memory controllers to deal with some of the scaling issues. And hopefully this is clear. We discussed several ways of making the memory control slightly more intelligent. Maybe it's not completely intelligent, but to deal with something like row hammer, for example, you need to be intelligent enough to uh, do the refresh at the right times. You need to know what uh, rows to refresh. And you need to know how the mapping happens between uh, different DRAM rows such that you know what are the physically adjacent rows, right? It's not huge intelligence, but it's more intelligence than what we have today in terms of how to handle reliability problems uh, in, in main memory. Refresh is a little bit more. Uh, a little bit harder, you need some intelligence to understand uh, what your retention times are, when they change, if they change, how they change, uh, and uh, what, are, what are the data patterns that are affecting your retention times. And if you would like to get rid of the refresh penalty significantly, we discussed that you need to be able to do that. And you need to have ECC error correcting codes also, because variable retention time is very difficult to handle uh, without error correcting codes. This is the sort of intelligence that we're being pushed towards uh, from the circuits and devices, mainly because of scaling issues. Later in the lectures, we will talk about hybrid memory systems. We've already briefly mentioned that, of course, but we'll go into more detail in terms of hybrid memory systems, emerging technologies like phase change memory, and they will require even more intelligence so that we can place data at the right uh, memory type. We mentioned this briefly in, in the past lectures when we talked about hybrid memory systems, but you will see more and more of that uh, intelligence that is being required as the memory system becomes more complex. And these are all bottom-up uh, parts. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more top-down and give you the pull from systems and applications. We've also talked about this uh, a little bit when we covered uh, major trends, but we're going to cover this a little bit more in the processing in memory because processing in memory in the end uh, is going to accelerate applications. Yes, there is a push from circuits and devices to make the memory controller more intelligent. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily mean that you should ex execute applications uh, close to memory. Yes, you should be more intelligent to handle all of these issues we're having. Part of it could be uh, executing applications that uh, are better fit for different types of memories, close to different types of memories. But there's another reason why we actually want to execute applications, which is uh, performance and efficiency. And I'm going to give you that perspective, the top-down per perspective now. And then we're going to talk about processing in memory go into at least two directions. I say two directions here because these are two uh, very interesting directions today enabled by uh, creativity and new technologies, basically. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about some of the other potential directions in processing in memory. And then we'll spend some time on adoption and then we will conclude. So this, 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 uh, this set of lectures can actually take three lectures. We will see, but hopefully you will see a good span uh, all the way from algorithms to circuits. So this is, uh, again, what we have promised before. It's uh, the expanded view of computer architecture. And hopefully you will see that expanded view of computer architecture coming into play, especially in a topic like this. And this is a topic that uh, essentially uh, a good chunk of the industry is very interested in because they're feeling the data movement bottleneck and they're investing a lot into understanding how we can better do uh, near data or in-memory computation. Okay, so that's the agenda. So let's, let me start with the, uh, 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 this uh, top-down trends, let's say, pull from systems and applications. Basically, uh, today, in today's systems and applications, data access is a major bottleneck. I'm, I've given you a lot of data points. I'm going to repeat some of them. Energy consumption is a key limiter, and data movement energy dominates computation energy. As a result, and this is true for off-chip to on-chip movements. As a result, there is a big observation opportunity 
Uh, and the observation is that uh, high latency and high energy is really caused by data movement uh, today. We have long energy hungry interconnects between processor and memory. We have energy hungry electrical interfaces, and we move large amounts of data on those interconnects and interfaces. As a result, we're really uh, exacerbating the high latency and high energy of these interconnects. So the opportunity is to minimize the data movement by performing computation directly inside or near where the data resides. So of course, there are different forms of aggressiveness, right? You could actually do the computation inside the memory cells. Uh, that's clearly very aggressive. You don't even move the data, maybe. Uh, you could do the computation a little bit farther away from the memory cells, but still within the memory array. You could do the uh, computation outside the memory array. You could do the computation inside the memory chip farther away from the memory arrays. You could do the computation on, on the memory module uh, on a separate chip. Uh, and then uh, on, a, on a layer that's dedicated to logic and 3D stack memory. And then uh, on the memory controller that's on a separate chip, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this also depends on what type of memory you're considering. You could do computation inside the caches or uh, close to the caches. Uh, again, as long as it's far away from the processor, not inside the processor, but closer to memory, it, it, that's what we're concerned about over here. Clearly, there are different trade-offs and benefits you get uh, depending on where exactly you do the computation. Okay, this general idea is called processing in memory, uh, PIM, in-memory computational processing or near data processing. You will see all these terms. I will use them interchangeably. You could decide to distinguish between them. For example, processing in memory, some people, sometimes people say it's really inside the memory arrays, but it's really used uh, for both in today's literature. So there's no distinction, in my opinion, between processing in memory and near data processing, although some people may actually distinguish uh, between those. Then you have to ask them, actually, what is the difference in your opinion, right, uh, to really understand what, what's the distinction. Okay, uh, and the general concept is, uh, as I mentioned, applicable to any data storage and movement unit. So you could do this in caches, SSDs, main memory, network, controllers, whatever you can imagine. As long as data resides there or moves through there, you can do computation, and that's near data processing uh, or processing in memory or in network, uh, whatever uh, unit you have. Okay, so this will actually handle uh, many issues related to uh, future, future issues in memory pla uh, future platforms. I believe actually this is good for energy efficiency, uh, low latency, uh, specialized architectures as we will see, and also for security, reliability, and safety. If you're actually doing processing inside the memory where the data is, you're not moving the data as much. As a result, you're not leaking much information about that data. So you're getting closer to uh, a more fundamentally secure architecture because a lot of the issues that we see today uh, in, in terms of attacks are caused by data movement uh, as well. If you're not moving data, maybe you can protect it much better, right? When, whenever you start moving data, it becomes difficult to protect essentially. So in that sense, uh, processing in memory is actually something that can uh, tackle all of these issues at the same time. But I'm gonna motivate it from an energy perspective because that's one of the most critical things. But keep in mind that uh, this, this could be a solution to a lot of these issues that we have on the slide. I'm going to use the same slide from Abraham Maslow. Essentially, we motivated reliability, saying that reliability is the most important pillar, let's say, uh, that enables humans to do everything else, reliability and security and safety, as you can see over here. But that's not necessarily true, actually. If you don't have energy to do things, maybe you don't really care about your security, right? Of course, uh, how to prioritize this becomes important now. Uh, maybe sometimes security is important, sometimes energy is more important. But clearly, if you are out of energy, you're, you're in the brink of death, let's say, then you're not able to, you're, you don't even care about your safety probably, right? So there's an extreme case where energy is more important than security. So clearly it's important. Uh, I don't want to belabor the analogy over here. Uh, and I think there's a bigger question in my mind uh, when, when we talk about issues like this. Do we want a world that looks like this, that's beautiful, that's sustainable, uh, where we can breathe in? Uh, and uh, yeah, essentially uh, good, let's say, sustainable? Or do we want a world that looks like this, that we cannot breathe in and that's not sustainable, but it's very productive? So I would argue that we want the best of both worlds. We don't want the worst of both worlds, clearly. So we really want uh, sustainability, of course, which comes with energy efficiency. And we also want high performance and high productivity at the same time. So the question is, how do we get all of them at the same time? The problem is today, data access is a major performance and energy bottleneck. And our current design principles cause great energy waste, as we have discussed earlier as well. Uh, basically, we're moving data all around. We're doing processing far away from the data. 
that's going to be my next slide. As a result, we're causing great energy waste. And our current design principles also cause great performance loss, but I put this in parentheses because uh, we do a lot to tolerate the data movement uh, so, so that it doesn't cause a lot of performance loss. Uh, basically, we design memory systems that have many levels of hierarchies. We design sophisticated prefetching algorithms. We design multi-threading mechanisms, as we've discussed in digital design and computer architecture, or as you've seen in other lectures, for example. Uh, we design sophisticated hierarchies, for example, make memory system much, much more complex. Uh, and also we design uh, CPUs that are heavily out of order superscalar so that we can tolerate these latencies. So we do a lot and increase complexity along the way to uh, tolerate the data movement latency, but this causes in the end even more energy waste. So we're in a vicious cycle right now. We, ha we, ha we, have, we have this data movement problem because we're processing data far away from the data. And as a result, we're causing great energy waste. On top of that, to prevent the performance implications, we're causing even more energy waste and complexity. So we, we cannot get out of this vicious cycle at this point, in my opinion, unless we identify the real problem and break it at the source. And I believe this is the real problem. We're processing data far away from the data, and we don't have any other option today, basically. We have to move the data to the processor that's far away from the data fundamentally because of our design principles today. Uh, and if you remember this picture that I put up earlier, a computing system consists of computation, communication, and storage, and memory. And essentially, we, have, we are very processor-centric in the design of modern computing systems. Uh, all data is processed in the processor at great system cost. Processor is heavily optimized and is considered the master. And everything else is, let's say, dumb. Uh, they don't, they're not able to do stuff to the data. They're able to store and move data, but they cannot operate on the data. As a result, uh, they have less value, let's say. And this causes the problems that we have uh, at hand. Uh, data movement becomes a bottleneck. And you can see this reflected in prices of units also. If you look at uh, a high performance processor, its price is much higher, right? Compared to uh, something else over here, uh, uh, like the memory and storage. Memory and storage may be expensive overall because we have a lot of it. But if you look at uh, price per area or price per bit, memory and storage is actually much smaller in terms of price uh, compared to a computing unit that we have today, a CPU or a GPU or a machine learning accelerator, for example. Uh, so it's, it's reflected in prices, it's reflected in the business models, it's reflected in economics, and it's reflected uh, clearly in the energy and performance that we see out of these systems. So it's, it's, it's a problem that's endemic to uh, the entire system because it's really caused by the principles of, where, how, of how we're designing systems today. And processing in memory is going to try to break that basically. It's, trying to, it's going, to, uh, going to enable intelligence and ability to process data and the other units in its most general form. Okay, uh, I think I've talked about this before, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but clearly we know that memory is a problem. I'm going to give you different perspectives. Uh, we've given you the reliability perspective, for example. Uh, memory is a big reliability problem. As a result, we want intelligence in the memory. A uh, security problem also, we want intelligence in the memory uh, to solve those. I'm going to give you the performance as well as energy efficiency perspectives, which we've kind of given before. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. I mentioned that Dick Seitz, after his team designed the alpha processor, he wrote this article, uh, which is entitled, It's the Memory Stupid, uh, because he basically said that we designed this processor to actually finish four instructions per cycle, but it's finishing uh, more uh, one instruction every 4.7 cycles in this important workload. So it's operating at 1 18th of its peak bandwidth. Why? It's because it's waiting for data from memory. And if you remember that this was a very strong statement by a chief architect, right, who uh, dedicated his life to designing processors. I suspect, I, I expect that over the coming decade, memory systems and design will be the only important design issue for microprocessors. Okay. And we covered uh, some of the experiments that I have done as a PhD student uh, in my PhD studies. This was actually my first paper that I wrote. If I, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but we did th this work together with Intel and we used all of Intel's workloads and found out that most of the time an aggressive processor, an Intel processor at the time is basically spending its time waiting for data. Most of the time you can see that it's more than 50% of the time. So nothing has changed over the, over the course of uh, what, ha uh, what uh, Dick Seitz said and what I have done, as you can see. And if you're interested, you can read uh, the paper. We may actually at some point cover it. We may not, but a lot of you are interested in asking me some uh, papers to read. So this is one of the papers I, I would recommend, uh, definitely. And this is actually another uh, version of it that was invited. Uh, 
Okay, and this is the Excites article. Uh, if you're interested, you can read it also. It's only one pages. It's, uh, we already uploaded it. If, and you can also click on the slides, as you can see over here. Uh, it's only one page. It's not plurally one, right? It's, so it's, it's, it's fun to read. And if you're interested in an informal thing, as I mentioned, there's an interview that we talk about these things. Okay, uh, and uh, I mentioned also this work by Google, uh, which showed that, again, uh, in all of their data center workloads, which are really interesting workloads, as you can see over here, processing in the data center for video, search, indexing, Gmail. Uh, uh, the big table is uh, Google's uh, big file, uh, part of the file system, I think. Uh, ads, you can see a lot of interesting things, but they basically show the same thing. Most of the time, uh, the processors they use in their data center is waiting for data. It's doing useful work only 10 to 20% of the time. Useful work meaning retiring, finishing instructions. Okay, so clearly this doesn't sound good, right? I've given you the history of more than 20 years over here. And uh, essentially, even though processors got better, they're still waiting for data being stolen. And this is because of the way we design processors. I don't think we're gonna get away from this anytime soon. They will be waiting for data uh, uh, if we keep designing them the way uh, we're designing them. Which means that we have a grossly imbalanced system, right? Because processing is done in one place, data moves a lot, and processor is waiting for data, it's imbalanced. As a result, this is energy inefficient, low performance, and complex. And uh, as, as, as I said, we make the processor even more complicated uh, to tolerate data access from memory. We add complex hierarchies and mechanisms, some of which we are going to see, some of which you're, going to, you're actually implementing in your labs, the caches, for example, that you have implemented in your first lab and the uh, next level of caches that you're going to implement in your second lab uh, are actually uh, there to tolerate data access from memory. Uh, but if the processing was, in, was done in memory, uh, will we really need that many levels of caches, for example? It's a good question to ask. And again, uh, when I talk about processor, I always talk about accelerators also because they're, they're similar. Uh, accelerators, are not, uh, accelerators are things that accelerate some sort of computation, right? Uh, uh, and uh, they're also uh, uh, not operating near data, but we're going to see near data accelerators soon. Okay, uh, making things overly complex is clearly complex, and uh, it makes things energy inefficient and low perform. So we're in this vicious cycle, and we would like to break this vicious cycle, as I said. And one of the examples of this vicious cycle is the amount of processing uh, that's dedicated uh, on the uh, processor chip in terms of area is low uh, is very low it's about five to ten percent of a, a node area as you can see and if you include the storage actually it's much lower than that so basically most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data because of the way we're designing because of the fundamental principle we're designing systems okay so that's the performance perspective there are many many other papers written about this actually i referenced some of them and you may see some of them later on if you're interested i'd be happy to uh, give you other references too but let's take a look at the energy perspective energy perspective is perhaps even more uh, uh, stronger than performance today. Because performance, okay, we're somehow dealing with it, right? <laughs> Even though we're waiting for data, the performance is improving, we're dealing with it somehow, it's not great because we could do much better. But energy, we're really not able to deal with. We're moving data and we're spending energy and there's no way we're going to overcome that energy loss. Uh, and energy loss, is, as we mentioned, is uh, getting worse. Uh, so this is the slide that I borrowed from Bill Daly's high peak keynote that shows that a 64-bit double precision floating point operation is 20 picojoules, a, 60, a DRAM read or write is 16 nanojoules. Okay, okay, these are numbers from five years ago. Uh, depends on some process. Uh, and also 64-bit double precision floating point operation is a very complicated operation, actually. It's not simple. Uh, but you can see that the number is 800x. And today, a memory access consumes uh, somewhere between two to three orders of magnitude the energy of a complex edition. So it's not great. And it's always good to ask the question, if you don't have good locality and if you're adding two double precision floating point numbers, does it really make sense to bring each of them one by one into the processor first, do the operation, and then write the result back to the year? So that doesn't sound good because now you're actually uh, uh, exacerbating the memory bottleneck three times. You're accessing memory three times. So you're consuming three times, uh, two to three orders of magnitude more energy than the operation that you're actually uh, bringing data for. Okay, so that doesn't sound good. And this is actually something that we cannot avoid. And many applications actually don't have uh, enough locality uh, to uh, compensate for the energy loss uh, that you have in DM. Remember that energy losses for one access, uh, well, you need two operands. Uh, to be able to do this double precision floating point operation, right? 
two operands, you need to bring two operands, which means that you need to consume, according to these numbers, 32 nanojoules. Now, 32 nanojoules is 1,600 times uh, the energy consumed for this operation. So if you want to be energy equivalent, you really need to reuse these data some number of times, and you can do the calculation if you're interested. Uh, and that number of times is a lot, actually, uh, to compensate. And many applications don't have that amount of locality today. As a result, uh, you're losing energy uh, overall by uh, doing computation on, on chip in, uh, and bringing data into the caches. Because in some applications, as we will see in graph, uh, some of the graph processing workloads, for example, uh, performance uh, will be bottlenecked by random memory accesses. And if you're most of the time doing random memory accesses, your caches are essentially, by definition, uh, useless because they require some sort of locality. And if you're doing random accesses on a graph, on a large graph, you're not getting any locality, right? Okay. Uh, okay, so this is actually a very instructive picture over here. Uh, Today, we're, uh, I mean, double precision floating point operation is actually expensive. So it's somewhere uh, between two, 200x, let's say, uh, right now, maybe not 800x. Uh, a simple add is cheaper. Uh, so you actually get even higher uh, 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 energy consumption uh, uh, multiplier uh, with a memory access compared to cheaper add. But if you go back 70 years ago, let's say, whenever the first general purpose computers were being designed, uh, the, the picture was actually a bit different. Uh, the picture was uh, such that uh, uh, the, the cost of a, uh, a floating point operation or any operation actually that is done on chip was much higher than the cost of a memory access. And you can ask the question why here? Well, uh, and the answer would be technology scaling. Over the course of 70, 80 years, we were able to scale the technology really well. Meaning, what is technology scaling? As you reduce the size of a circuit, you, you get better efficiency out of it, right? Both performance and energy. And in this case, the circuit is logic gates. So CMOS technology, complementary metal oxide semiconductor technology scaled really well. Uh, as a result, we were able to reduce the size of the logic in addition to its energy efficiency and performance and improve its performance. This worked really well for logic, but unfortunately this didn't really work well for interconnect on chip or off chip, especially off chip, and also interconnect uh, and, and capacitors, which DRAM is fundamentally built with, or other elements like resistive elements, uh, we, which we may discuss, although they're not, not much more scalable in different ways. Uh, so basically, interconnects did not scale and capacitor did not scale. As a result, 70 years uh, benefited uh, the logic gates, and this became much cheaper than in the past, but uh, accessing memory through the interconnects and capacitors did not become cheaper in terms of energy as well as performance. Well, it became cheaper, but comparatively, it didn't become as much cheaper. Uh, as a result, where uh, uh, while this was two orders of magnitude worse 70 or 80 years ago, now it's two to three orders of magnitude better. So we have swung four to five orders of magnitude worse on the memory direction over the course of 70, 80 years. So that doesn't sound good, but we're still using the exist, uh, same principles, which is a processor-centric design to actually process data. So essentially, technology enabled us to do uh, to uh, do much better logic, much worse memory, but we're still using the same principles to design systems. Uh, and people are finally questioning those principles uh, over the course of years. They have questioned it, but now you can see that also in the industry, right, with the chips that we've discussed the UPMEMS in DM processing engine is one example, and Cerebrus's wafer scale processor, processor is another example of this, basically. They're building wafer scale so that they can get memory and compute closer to each other. Okay, so I can talk a lot about the slide, and feel free to ask questions as uh, you always do. Uh, we can discuss uh, your questions uh, uh, over time. But uh, I guess I will, sell, I will say one more thing on the slide over here, uh, which is, uh, there, uh, in, in, in one of the top conferences uh, in uh, systems uh, in HPCA, I think in 2002, there was a debate. And the debate was titled, uh, is the problem memory or is the problem interconnect? And uh, clearly it was a lively debate. Uh, I mean, I was a graduate student at that time. Uh, I was interested in all of these questions. Uh, I think the question is a bit moot actually. Uh, if you think about memory, most of it is really interconnect also, as we will see. 
later on. You will see in some of this, but we will see later on when we talk about memory latency. Memory is very much dominated by the interconnect and memory access is dominated by the interconnect uh, to access memory. So I think it's really both in the end and it's uh, at some level, they're fundamentally uh, not distinguishable because in order to be able to build memories, you need long interconnects. For example, if you want to have a very large bank, you need to have a long interconnect to be able to access every single uh, word line on that bank, every single row in that bank. And that's true for every single column as well. So you, need to, you have a two-dimensional structure and that two-dimensional stru structure is not just full of cells, but a lot of interconnect to enable access to those cells also. So these things are not distinguishable from each other uh, at some point. And the problem is really uh, both memory and interconnect at the same time. If interconnect, for example, scaled extremely well over the course of the last 70 years, maybe we would have much less of a problem. Uh, then cell access would be important. But again, interconnect did not scale well. And uh, we're, we're at the point we, where we are today. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some historical perspective into the issues as well. Okay, so uh, again, as I said, we can talk more about this, but there are a lot of works that show that a significant amount of energy is spent uh, on data movements. Uh, and uh, so there are some other numbers you can get also, basically. Uh, and uh, a memory access consu consumes more than two orders of magnitude, energy, as much energy as uh, an ad operation. So two orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude. Okay, there's some difference clearly, but it's still a lot, two to three orders of magnitude. So uh, actually, uh, some folks were actually describing uh, the AI accelerators that they had designed in one of the conferences, uh, the design automation conference in 2019 when I attended. And uh, some folks were saying in their system, for example, uh, a memory access uh, costs 160 times the energy of a floating point multiply and accumulate. So that's a sophisticated operation, floating point multiply and accumulate. It's used for... Uh, clearly, uh, uh, a lot of AI and machine learning operations, convolutions, for example, uh, or matrix multiplication, for example. And uh, that's, uh, even that is 160 times better than a memory access in a sophisticated state-of-the-art machine learning accelerator. So that's, the, that's one of the state-of-the-art numbers, as you can see over here. As a result, uh, we will cover this paper more. Uh, May, perhaps tomorrow, maybe not today. But uh, we have found out that more than 60% of the entire system energy is spent on data movement on important applications that we care about, as we will see later on. So basically, we do not want to move data. Moving data is not good for performance, is not good for energy, is not good for security and reliability. Why don't we just keep data where it is and change the paradigm of computation such that we can enable computation with minimal data movement Compute where it makes sense, where the data resides, or while the data moves, if it's really needed to move, because clearly at some point it will need to move somewhere so that you can read it, for example, uh, at the most fundamental sense. You, you need to need it, read it and you need to move it, perhaps. But of course, I mean, this is also not necessary, right? You can, you can have a single uh, uh, computer where you have the display attached to the uh, memory as well. Uh, and uh, then you, don't, you may not actually even need, need to read it. You may actually have all of the peripherals attached to a single uh, device uh, with, with, with monolithic 3D stacking technologies, this could become possible going into the future. So you could imagine a single system where everything is attached to that and you move the data minimally uh, within that system. You don't go through large off-chip interconnects. So that's the future potentially, right? And that future is very, very interesting clearly, but we're not there yet. Uh, so we do need to move data in existing systems, but in, uh, in a maybe, uh, hopefully interesting future, we may imagine a future where we don't move data at all, or we, we move data only in uh, a stack, uh, in, in uh, layers of the stack, or uh, uh, let's, let's call it a box, right? We move inside a box, but we never get out of, outside of uh, uh, layers. Okay, uh, but basically we would like to enable things like that uh, step by step, and we would like to compute where it makes sense, where data resides first. And we'd like to make computing architectures more data-centric essentially as opposed to processor-centric. And that's what processing in memory is all about. Okay, uh, from now on, I'm going to focus on memory. Clearly, there are other parts of the system, storage, caches, et cetera, where the ideas that I'm going to describe will be applicable to with some changes potentially, right? Uh, so this is a very general idea, but I'm going to focus uh, on main memory so that we can make things a little bit more concrete. Uh, memory is also very interesting, main memory. It's more interesting than caches, I believe. It's more interesting than storage. Uh, for many applications, let's say, uh, because 
uh, this is where you can get very low latency access to data. Okay, caches, you can get very low latency access to data also, but it's of limited size, right? But main memory is of very high, uh, large size. So you can actually store many of your uh, full databases, let's say. There, there's a concept called in-memory data say, databases, in-memory graph processing, in-memory media processing, where people actually fit the data as much as possible into the memory, such that they can minimize accesses to the storage. Now you can actually operate on that data. Now, uh, processing inside memory enable, uh, uh, asks the question or proposes that memory is intelligent. We store stuff in it, but we, we're also able to ask questions to memory like, memory, can you do this operation? Can you do this query on this database for me? Can you search for my uh, neighboring graph nodes and give me a query on those? Like how many friends do I have, right, if that's interesting? Or if you're doing some genomics analysis on graphs uh, and everything is graph-based, uh, uh, whether my genome actually is vulnerable uh, to COVID-19, let's say, right? Uh, uh, or whether my genome is similar to this other person's genome who may be vulnerable to some disease, right? You can ask those questions basically, assuming the data is stored in memory. And the memory basically says, oh, I can do this for you and here are the results. Or it says, oh, I cannot do it for you. Go and, go and ask someone else or do it somewhere else, right? So this sort of intelligent interaction is what's missing today uh, with memory. Whereas we can do this with processor cores and uh, to, to some extent with accelerators like GPUs, machine learning accelerators, et cetera, as well. So this is the sort of intelligence that we want from memory. Clearly this is interesting and this requires a lot of effort and it actually spans across the stack. Uh, transformation layers. Basically, there are many questions. So how do we design the compute capable memory and controllers? We're going to talk about that. How do we design the processor chip and in-memory units after that? Uh, how do we design the software and hardware interfaces to enable this? We're going to talk about some of those, uh, but uh, there's a lot more to do in these areas. How do we design the system software, compilers, and languages uh, to actually enable this to become seamless, such that the programmer doesn't need to go through and figure out exactly what data needs to be in what memory cell so that you can get the best performance out of it. Maybe the compiler does that. Uh, system software components like memory allocators do that. And your programmer just talks to the language uh, and indicates that, oh, this should be executed in memory. And please pack the data uh, good enough so that it could be executed in memory in a, uh, with, with benefit, right? So there's a lot to be done in these levels also as we will discuss. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, oh, Okay, uh, algorithms and theoretical foundations also. How do we redesign the algorithm such that you can get benefits uh, out of uh, this sort of execution? How do you redesign the algorithm such that you can actually execute things in memory? Because existing algorithms may not be suitable for execution in memory. Uh, they are suitable for execution in the course, as we will discuss, right? That's true for accelerators also, right? Existing algorithms, for example, that you design for a CPU is likely not suitable for a GPU. So you go back and you think about the algorithm and you revise the algorithm such that you actually improve performance on a GPU. True for our machine learning accelerators as well, uh, as well. So in a sense, memory is similar to an accelerator, but of course, it's very fundamentally different from an existing accelerator because all of the accelerators are actually uh, not near data accelerators. They're basically sitting similarly to where this processor core is placed. Whereas we're thinking about accelerators that are actually over here inside the memory. So there, there's, there will be some similarities and differences between uh, a GPU, for example, and an accelerator sitting next to memory uh, so keep that in mind. Some of the programming models may be similar. Some of the uh, compiler support may be similar, not necessarily exactly similar, uh, but a lot of the issues are similar. How do I actually redesign the algorithms? How do I uh, redesign compilers to do this automatically? How do, I, how do I redesign system software, languages? So we're already doing it for many, many accelerators today with some success. We basically need to do it for near data processing engines. And this is happening, of course, uh, in, in industry, uh, but there's a lot more research also needed into it. I'm going to give you some of the research perspective as well as the industry perspective. Okay, uh, so there's a lot to do, uh, but there's also differences between accelerators and memory. None of the accelerators over here uh, are actually bound by the structure of memory. So that's one downside of in-memory accelerators. You're bound by the structure of memory over here internally, as we will see. Uh, and also, uh, but, but that there's an upside also, you're basically you have low latency, uh, high bandwidth, low energy access to vast amounts of data, uh, whereas none of the other accelerators actually do uh, have that luxury. Okay, so that's why you need to consider a lot of these similarly to accelerators, but also different from accelerators. And I also mentioned theoretical foundations over here, which is very interesting to me. Basically today, 
uh, if you've taken, uh, how many of you have taken a computer science uh, theory of computation course? I'm very curious. You can feel free to raise hands. Uh, I know half of the class is computer science, half of the class is electrical engineering, which is very nice. I think we have a good mixture. Okay, no one has raised hands. Interesting. Uh, I mean, if you're coming from computer science, uh, at some point you should take a theory of computation course. And if you take that theory of computation course, uh, basically you will see that uh, uh, whenever you theorize about algorithms, you're counting operations. Basically, if you want to look at the complexity uh, of an algorithm, you approximate that complexity by counting uh, using uh, by using a big O notation, let's say. And this is the uh, notation that says how many operations uh, do you need to do? Uh, and how, how do those operations scale with the size of your uh, structures? Okay, but that may not be the best way. That's a very processor-centric way of thinking about computing theory, right? How many operations do I do in the processor? If the memory is the bottleneck, maybe we should really think about how we actually co uh, uh, quantify the complexity of our algorithms. Maybe it should be really about memory and how much memory they spend, how, much, how many data accesses they do, as opposed to how many operations they do. Or maybe it should be a combination of multiple things, right? So I believe actually processing in memory is disruptive as well, because uh, since we're used to processor-centric designs, theoretical foundations of com computing have been based on uh, processor-centric concepts. But once you become data-centric and memory-centric, all those concepts may not be very useful or maybe of limited use because there are other bottlenecks. And in fact, I believe today they're of limited use also because there are other bottlenecks in the system, which is memory, as you can see, 50% of the time. You don't care about operations you're doing because you don't have data to do the operations on. Okay, so this slide, again, I spent a lot of time, but it's very important to get the high, uh, high level picture, I think. Again, we span all the way from algorithms to devices over here. How do we design the devices to be fundamentally good at computation? And this is really a device level uh, thing, for, exa uh, for example, how do you redesign the capacitor? How do you redesign the uh, resistive elements? How do you design the matrix that you have, uh, two-dimensional array that you have? These are actually really device level questions. And the algorithm layer, how do you actually map my algorithm uh, to match the characteristics of the device in the best, best way such that I can do computation as well as memory? And the middle layers basically need to enable everything such that everything is seamless, right? So clearly this is uh, another example of Com computer architecture's expanded view. And I think processing in memory is a great example of this because we really need to re-examine the entire stack over here. But we need to do it, of course, very carefully as well. If you want adoption, you cannot really disrupt the entire stack immediately. You really need to have ways of adopting, uh, ways of uh, enabling people to adopt uh, the new ideas. And we're gonna talk about that. In fact, we're gonna start very simple very soon. Okay. So basically, I've given you the picture. Uh, there's a, uh, why, why is in-memory computation interesting today? There's a huge push from technology. Uh, DRAM scaling that jeopardy. As a result, controls, uh, uh, industry is designing controls close to DRAM and people are open to new memory architectures. Uh, this is something that's squeezing us from the bottom up. And there's something, uh, and we've already discussed that, uh, there, are lo uh, there are essentially controllers close to DRAM that are being built with 3D stacked architectures. You have a logic layer and memory layers on top of them. And there's actually even more sophisticated things that are being looked at. Uh, this is an odometer processor that was designed by Micron. You can basically do simple operations in the row buffer of a bank. Uh, and uh, you can do essentially deterministic finite automaton calculations in the row buffer, which is very interesting clearly. Uh, it's discontinued right now, but you can see that people are actually trying things. Uh, companies are trying things today. These are not discontinued. 3D stacked architectures are well and alive and there, there are going to be more and more of them. Uh, coming forward. High bandwidth memory is one example. It's being used as two and a, two and a half D stacked. We will see that later on uh, in GPUs, uh, but uh, there's more uh, to come over there. Okay, so we're basically being pushed from technology bottom up and we're basically pulled, uh, being heavily pulled from systems and applications top down. Essentially, we're kind of squeezed in the middle. Uh, we need to do something uh, new in terms of how we handle data and I believe in-memory computation or near data processing is an example of it. So this is an idea that uh, has been around for a long time. The first incarnation of the idea is actually, I should have put uh, that slide in 1970. Uh, it's, a, it's called the Logic in Memory Computer by Harold Stone. If you're interested, you can read that paper actually. And uh, that basically says we should do computation near data for cost reasons. It's too costly 
uh, many chips, why don't we actually do computation near data inside the memory chip? Okay, uh, that pushes a lot of complexity into the memory chip, so maybe that's not uh, easy to adopt clearly. And uh, over the course of years and years, more than 50 years, let's say, people have looked at in-memory computation, near data computation in some way, but it never took off. I believe it never took off because we were never constrained as much. Basically, this push from technology was not there. Rohammer was not there, clearly. It's a phenomenon that was published six years ago. Uh, refresh issues were not as bad. Energy issues were not as bad. And all of the application issues were not as bad. Machine learning applications were not there. Uh, uh, the, the, the key machine learning revolution really started, uh, let's say second revolution, really started eight years ago uh, when folks published that you could actually do machine learning inference using GPUs, right? So it, actually, GPUs were an enabler for a machine learning revolution. And as a result, people became much more constrained in terms of data and energy for that application domain. And I, as I mentioned, that genomics is going to be an even bigger application domain. So basically, all of these innovations, all of these realizations, let's say, maybe not necessarily innovations, but their realizations plus innovations, happened within the course of last six to eight years. OK, stretch it, a decade. So we're being constrained much more within the last decade. Uh, and as a result, we're kind of squeezed in the middle. So that's why I believe in-memory computation, near data processing are things that are really, really in in important to examine today. And as a result, uh, people are actually examining it even in industry. As I mentioned, this is UPMEM processing in DRM engine. We may actually have a session related to this uh, uh, later on in the course if people are interested. Please uh, uh, let me know your feedback. Uh, I will adapt the course depending on your feedback and what people are interested in. But basically, th uh, these folks from UPMEM which is based in Grenoble, France, uh, put actually processing units inside the DRM chip. And these are not small processing units. These are relatively big processing units. They call it data processing units. Uh, essentially, uh, these processing units, uh, there's a processing unit uh, per bank. Each bank, and, and the processing unit can operate data on the, on the data that's stored in the bank. And it can do it with low latency, high bandwidth, and low energy because you don't need to move the data outside of the chip. So clearly, this is very, very interesting. And mapping algorithms to this chip is very interesting. We're actually working with these folks uh, to look at how, how can we make this easier to program and what kind of benefits do we get, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there's a lot to do in this area uh, going into the future. But the key takeaway is things are different from 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. There are companies that are looking into this. I should actually put Cerebras over here also. Uh, I don't have it, but you remember that we talked about Cerebras. It's a wafer scale processor. It's essentially another way of putting compute close to data. Uh, now, it doesn't fundamentally change the paradigm uh, in a sense uh, that compute is close to data on the same chip, uh, but uh, you're still uh, bringing data uh, into the processor. That's true in UPMEM also, actually. Uh, in UPMEM, uh, you actually have a processor over here. Uh, and you bring the data from the memory chip to the processor. So these are uh, not doing operations inside the array, as we will see in a little bit. Uh, so it's not changing the paradigm completely, but it's changing the paradigm in some way such that processor is not the only place where you do the operations. You can do the operations inside the DRAM chip as well. OK, uh, so this is very interesting. And I believe uh, uh, UPMEM is thinking slightly differently from past approaches. Past approaches said, OK, we have the large processor that we designed today. Let's put it inside the memory chip. I think that's not going to be very nice because fundamentally, a DRAM process or memory process and logic process are not very compatible. So you get a very leaky processor and very energy efficient, inefficient, and very slow processor in the end on the memory chip. Uh, whereas these UPMAM folks are actually putting small processors on the memory chip. Still, uh, their processors need to be slow because they actually uh, are, are operating on the memory process over here. Maybe people should investigate into memory plus logic processes, but that's not an easy direction. Uh, and that's uh, beyond computer architecture uh, at this point. So we can talk about that separately. Uh, but we still need to think differently from past approaches uh, because past approaches, I think, putting a huge processor on a memory chip is not going to work well. And no one has succeeded in that so far. Uh, maybe small processors, people will succeed. Let's see. So let's talk about uh, these different approaches. So I'm going to talk about two different approaches. One is minimally changing memory chips, and the second is exploiting 3D stacked memory. So let's start with the first one, uh, minimally changing memory chips. Surprisingly, this is an approach that has not been looked at as much in the past. Uh, and again, I'm going to give you examples from DRAM, 
Uh, by the way, don't underestimate DRAM. DRAM is a huge industry. Almost all of the main memories that we have today are DRAMs. Uh, some of them are SRAMs, very small. It's expensive. If you're really, uh, really lucky, you could actually have very large SRAMs. Uh, and a very small fraction is phase change memory, et cetera. But uh, the market is really dominated by DRAM today. That's why DRAM manufacturers are doing maybe too well today, right? Uh, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to describe is going to be actually applicable to any type of memory. Actually, any type of memory has the capability to perform bulk data movement and computation internally with small changes. Why? Because there is some inter interconnect inside the memory, and you can exploit that internal interconnect or connectivity to move data. And on top of that, you can add more connectivity. And we're going to see this. We're going to see both approaches in a little bit. On top of this, there's some analog computation capability any memory is capable of. And we're going to see this in uh, DRAM, but this is true for uh, phase change memory, for example. This is true for uh, uh, RRAM, resistor RAM as well. It's true for flash also. So you can exploit analog computation capability to actually do computation. And we're going to see this. Uh, uh, in a little bit also uh, in this talk, uh, in this lecture, or in, in, in multiple of these lectures, let's say. Uh, okay. Uh, and then you can do more, perhaps, as we will see, uh, potentially. And these are some examples. This is not a sophisticated list, but I'm going to cover some of these. So we're going to start simple in this lecture. We're going to really start bottom up, uh, but we're going to motivate it from real applications. So what is the simplest thing that you can do inside memory? And I will argue that it's maybe initialization of data. Copy is a little bit more complex, actually. But let, let me talk about both of them, bulk data copy and bulk data initialization. Basically, what is bulk data copy? You have a four kilobyte page. We're going to copy it to another location that has four kilobytes. Or you have one gigabyte page, and you're going to copy it to another location that's one gigabyte. Right? OK. Now you can see that if you do that copy through the processor, it's going to be expensive. Initialization, you have a one terabyte database in memory. Your memory is four terabytes. And you initialize that one terabyte to all zeros. Physically, clear that takes time, right? So these are operations that are really simple, as you can see. Uh, but uh, today, we're not doing it inside memory. We're actually doing them inside the CPU, which is probably not a great thing, as we will see. And actually, there is a lot of interesting papers. Uh, as I mentioned, in this course, we're going to talk a lot about hardware software interfaces and uh, algorithm hardware co-design. Uh, and uh, operating system hardware interface, another interface that's really, really important in my opinion, but that's really not looked at as much. Uh, we have some work looking into that. You will see that uh, later on, uh, but there's uh, clearly some papers that are written saying that, okay, the, uh, actually uh, this paper uh, talks about bulk data copy and initialization saying that copy is really important, but unfortunately there's not much support for it in the architecture. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, this, uh, these folks, uh, Mendel uh, and uh, Edward, uh, uh, went later and uh, co-founded VMware. VMware is uh, clearly the top virtualization company today. And uh, I spent some time at VMware. And uh, VMware is actually uh, uh, very much bound by copy performance. Whenever you actually uh, create a new virtual machine, for example, you need to copy uh, a lot of things. And uh, how to do those copies matter and your performance is very much impacted uh, by uh, how fast you can do those copies or if you can eliminate those copies as much as possible. We may get back to that in a little bit. Okay, so there's other papers that talk about why aren't operating systems getting faster as fast as hardware? Well, because there's not enough support uh, for copy. And this paper actually is interesting because it proposes uh, copy uh, mechanisms uh, in the memory controller, uh, which is going to be some of our baselines when we talk about uh, in-memory processing. And this paper is an improvement uh, over that, as you can see. OK, so bulk data copy and initialization is actually important. There is a lot of papers that are written over it. I just gave you an example of four of them over here. And there are a lot of applications that benefit from it. Whenever you fork, for example, you need to copy pages. OK, you copy on write today, meaning that you don't immediately copy the page, but you actually make, create a copy whenever you need to actually write uh, to the copy itself. Uh, and copy may be non-existent until you actually modify the page. Uh, it's called copy on write, but this is actually used in existing systems, operating system zero initialization or initialization with different values. Uh, your operating system initializes, initializes pages that it's not using, for example, because whenever you want to allocate that page to some other application, uh, you don't want to leak what was on that page before, because this could be a security issue. So zero, zero, zeroing of physical pages is critically important. Checkpointing, I'm not going to go into detail, migrating pages, 
and virtual machine cloning and deduplication, actually, as I mentioned uh, before, VMware is heavily bound by that. And again, if you don't believe me over here, uh, hopefully you do believe me, uh, but there's some data that uh, Google folks uh, collected in their data center workloads in the, in the paper that I mentioned earlier in this talk. They basically said that just these two function calls, memmo and memcopy, accounts for about 5% of the execution cycles over all of the workloads that they're executing in their data center. Now, I would argue that that 5% is a lot. This is just two function calls you can see, right? And it's not all of the data copy. These are the data copies initialized by only two function calls. There may be other data copies that the programmer is doing without using those function calls. Clearly, that happens a lot. Uh, but these two function calls account for 5% of the cycles. And this paper actually is very interesting. I will actually quote it later on. This paper later says that what I'm going to describe next in this lecture is a very good direction to explore going into the future. They basically cite row clone and they say, okay, this is actually some interesting direction to explore because we're seeing a lot of copy bottlenecks. Okay, so now that I've given you a lot of motivation, hopefully, now let's take a look at how we do bulk copy in existing systems. And basically we go through the processor, as I mentioned before. Let's assume that you're copying a four kilobyte page to another four kilobyte page over here. You first go through, uh, copy, uh, you first uh, bring the source page byte by byte into the L1 cache over here, destination page byte by byte into the L1, do the write or copy, and then bring the destination page back into memory at some point, right? Write, write it back. Now, clearly, I don't, I'm not showing you over here, but this caused a lot of data movements. It's essentially four times three, four kilobytes times three, 12 kilobytes of data movements. Now, if your copy is at the granularity of one megabyte, it's three megabytes of data movements. One gigabyte, three gigabytes of data movements. Clearly, this is, not, this is getting out of hand, as you can see. Now, this is high latency because you need to do a lot of memory accesses. This is high bandwidth utilization on the memory bus, perhaps one of the most precious uh, buses in terms of bandwidth. In fact, I would argue that that's the most precious bus in terms of bandwidth because memory latencies are low and everybody wants to access memory. If you remember my picture, there are many, many accelerators also trying to access memory. At the same time, you're causing a lot of bandwidth waste and utilization on the bus. It causes cache pollution, but you could eliminate that in today's engines by doing the copy through the direct memory access engine. You could program the memory controller such that you could actually program, the memory controller actually does this copy, orchestrates this copy as opposed to CPU. So you could actually bypass the caches, not pollute the caches today. But it has some other overheads, which I'm not going to get into. And then it's called unwanted data movements. Because if you're actually copying the page and you're not going to reuse the page anytime soon, you're basically wasting a lot of data movements on the memory bus. And as I mentioned, initialization is a special case of copy. When you're initializing, you can actually write, let's say, let's say you write all zeros to one row, and then you copy that to other rows, okay? Okay, so this four kilobyte page copy is about 1,000 nanoseconds today and 3.6 microjoules with an existing technology if you do it through the DMA. So that's actually really slow and really energy inefficient. So if you show this picture to a 10-year-old child, let's say, and ask the question, okay, am I doing things right? I, I care about copy performance. Is this the way I should be handling it? Well, maybe the answer would be no. I, I, I didn't do the study, but I expect the answer would be no. Uh, because if someone who starts, starts with a blank, blank slate uh, usually thinks more healthy uh, than someone who's actually used to a paradigm and has never uh, uh, thought critically outside of that paradigm, which is the processor-centric paradigm. Okay, and basically the idea is that it's a future system. We're gonna think outside the box, which is this box of processor. and we're gonna do this and enable this. So memory is going to copy a source page to a destination page internally without disturbing anything else that goes on in the system. We call this row clone. You could call it in-memory copy, but you will see why it's called a row clone. And this is low latency because we're gonna use the internal connectivity inside here. Low bandwidth utilization because we're not gonna move any data over here. Uh, no cache pollution, but you could eliminate that today by doing this copy through the direct memory access engine and no unwanted data movement clearly because we're not moving the destination page or source page uh, back into the CPU. So of course, maybe you don't do it for every single copy, but you do it whenever it makes sense to do it. So I'm not, uh, basically keep this in mind for everything that I discussed later on. We would like to do in-memory computation whenever it makes sense to do it. If it really makes sense to do things inside the CPU because you have extremely good locality and you're gonna keep everything inside the CPU and you're, you're only, only rarely going to access memory 
and this needs to be really rarely, then by all means, go ahead, do, go ahead, do things in CPU. But usually most applications are not like that. In fact, a very small fraction of applications run inside the CPU without accessing memory, uh, uh, at least occasionally. Uh, so you, you, you may need to do this uh, actually in many applications. Okay, basically I'm gonna show you a mechanism that takes us 1,000 nanoseconds, 1,046 nanoseconds to 90 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules to 0 0.04 microjoules. So basically we're talking about two to three orders of magnitude as you can see over here. And the idea is very simple. It's called row clone. Uh, I'm going to look at the best case of the idea. Basically, you have a DM subarray. This is very similar to what we looked at earlier. It's a portion of a bank. And essentially, you have rows connected to this bank, and there's a row buffer, which is essentially in sense amplifiers. So in order to be able to access a row, you need to actually bring the data into the row buffer. So we're going to take advantage of that fact. So if you want to copy a source row of A to a destination row B over here, you first need to act uh, in row clone, you first need to activate the source row. Now, which brings the data into the row buffer. Now, the data of source row of A is strongly amplified in the row buffer, meaning that these are SRAM cells over here and amplifiers. They actually sense the cells over here and the data is very, very strong over here. As if you remember, at some point I said that the size of a, a, a row buffer cell over here is about 200 times, 100 to 200 times the size of a DRAM cell. So it's very strong over here. Now the next step in row clone is to take this and write it to another row. It's that simple basically. And the idea is to activate another row, which implicitly deactivates the source row. And activating the other row connects the contents of the sense amplifier row buffer to the other row. And because the sense amplifiers are much stronger than the cells over here in the destination row, they copy or they transfer the data that they have or charge they have into the cells over here. That's the idea basically. By doing two consecutive activates, activate source row, activate destination row, we use the row buffer as an intermediate buffer so that we can copy the data of the source row into the destination row. So it's very simple. You need negligible hardware changes. Uh, these, this hardware actually works as I will show you later on, even in existing uh, chips, there are many existing chips where you can actually make this work by violating the timing parameters. You're not supposed to do this, but if you actually do it and violate timing parameters, you can imitate uh, this back-to-back -back, back -back activation property. And that's the idea over here. Uh, of course, uh, our proposal is not to do it in existing chips, but there is a paper that I, I'm going to mention that showed that you could do in existing DRAM chips also with some reliability. Uh, but our proposal is actually to design the memory chip such that this is reliable such that you don't get, uh, you don't, uh, get actually uh, a downsides. Okay, let me see, there's a question. So basically we're skipping pre-charge step between two activate, exactly yes, exactly. Uh, so that's a good question. We're not doing a pre-charge in between. We're doing activate and then another activate. Okay, uh, and you can see the paper for circuit level simulations, et cetera, this works. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I will, as I mentioned, that uh, it works in existing off-the-shelf DEM also, but there's a pre-charge issued over there, other, uh, uh, but as, as we will discuss in a little bit. But uh, the idea here is not to issue the pre-charge. Okay, so what you get out of this is 11x 18 latency reduction, 74x energy reduction. Let's go into it a little bit more, basically. Why does this work? Uh, essentially, uh, this is a source row and destination row. I'm showing you only one cell and one bit line. Uh, imagine this being happening, of course, across the entire four kilobytes, eight kilobytes, your row size. So basically, initially, uh, the bit lines are pre-charged, as you can see, at VDD over two. Assume that source uh, cell is charged. Now what we're going to do is activate the source row. Uh, because of charge sharing principles, what happens at this point is the charge in the cell perturbs the bit line slightly. This is what happens. So there's some charge sharing that happens and the bit line gets perturbed. Because of that perturbation, the sense amplifier detects that perturbation and it starts to amplify the difference. And over time, it amplifies the difference. This becomes a VDD, this becomes zero. And again, because of charge sharing, what happens is sense amplifier restores the charge in the cell because now this is VDD, this is something lower than VDD, and this is much stronger, this is much weaker. As a result, this becomes VDD. So this is basically reading of a cell. What I've shown you is reading of a single cell of DUM. Okay, it's just activates basically. 
reading meanings activate in this case, clearly. Okay, so now that we've activated this, uh, the next step is really to activate the destination row. Of course, implicitly, we're going to deactivate the source row, but we're not going to pre-charge as one of your fellow students mentioned. There's no pre-charge over here, so this stays as the same. We're just going to activate the destination row, meaning connect uh, the access transistor over here with the bit line. And once you do that, the same thing happens, right? Uh, the same thing hap that happened over here is going to happen. This is VDD, this is zero. So there's chart sharing and VDD is going to get filled into the, sense, uh, into the capacitor over here because sense amplifier is much stronger, right? And that's what happens. So by doing two consecutive activates without doing a pre-charge in between, we did do the copy. And that's the fundamental circuit level reason why this works. Okay, at the high level, you do the activate, which brings the data into the source uh, the row buffer. And then you do the activate to the destination row, which brings the data into the uh, destination row. So all of the data becomes uh, the contents of the source row, as you can see over here. Okay, so this is clearly happening inside the subarray, but in order to generalize the mechanism, you need to be able to enable copies across banks as well, for example. Let's take a look at that. So the realization is that there's internal connectivity in the DAMP chip. There's a shared internal bus between different banks, and we're going to use that to copy data from one bank to another bank. So the idea is, let's, and here the granularity doesn't need to be a row granularity. In the previous case, the granularity had to be a row granularity because whenever you activate, you're activating an entire row. So you don't have any choice, but you have to be at the row granularity, which is Good and bad in a sense, because you're doing bulk copies, but it's bad in the sense that what if you don't want to do raw granularity copies, right? We're going to discuss this. There may be a granularity mismatch uh, in terms of, you may want to do a four kilobyte page copy, but your row is eight kilobytes. Well, too bad. What do you do? You either copy two pages at the same time, you increase the granularity of your page to eight kilobytes, not, may not be desirable, uh, or uh, you do something else, right? You do page coloring such that uh, these, these copies don't uh, affect you in some way. Okay, anyway, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this granularity is an issue. Here, the granularity is not an issue, basically. You can do the copy at the granularity of the shared internal bus. It's 64 bits, basically on a column by column basis. That's the idea. So let's assume that we want to copy three 64-bit chunks from this row in this bank, to this row in this bank, this is what we do. We set the source row into the read mode. We set the destination row into the write mode. And then we basically direct the read such that it goes to the bank that's in the write mode. That's the idea. Normally you do this to go out of the chip, right? If you set this to read mode, you basically get the data out of the bank that you're reading and take it out of the chip. Instead of taking it out of the chip, we direct it into uh, a bank that is in the write mode. And normally, if a bank is in the write mode, it gets data out of the chip uh, from here, and then a column gets written. Now, instead, it's getting the data from some other bank. So basically, it's very small modifications, as you can see, because this internal connectivity is already there. You need to be able to read from a bank, and you need to be able to read, write into a bank, actually any bank. We're just enabling uh, the ability to do reads from any bank uh, and, and write to any bank. OK, that's the idea, basically, interbank copy. Now, Unfortunately, this has multiple issues. Well, one is you can overlap the latency of read and write, which is good. As a result, you get some latency reduction. It's not 11.6x, it's 1.9x, as you can see, but not that bad. Energy reduction is not 74x, it's 3.2x. This is DM energy. So it's not bad, but it's not as great as what you could do inter, intra, intra sub array, right? Okay, now there's another issue that's over here, uh, which is whenever you're doing this copy internally, Unfortunately, you cannot move the data outside the memory chip also. Well, you could do it from potentially this one, but not, so you cannot do, do it from another bank. So this limits your bank level parallelism a little bit. So if you're doing a four kilobyte copy, let's say, from one bank to another bank, you cannot read from this bank, unfortunately, because clearly the internal and shared bus is occupied. So to be able to solve that problem, you need a better interconnect that enables uh, concurrent transfers from different banks, right? And we're gonna talk about interconnects later in this course, so keep that in mind. Your interconnect and memory are heavily related to each other, right? I'm already talking about interconnects, as you can see. This internal bus is an interconnect. Okay, so let me talk about generalized row clone. Intra-subarray is the fastest, as we've discussed, two consecutive activates. 
Interbank is the second fastest and second energy efficient. Now the slowest thing, unfortunately, is inter -subway. So you're in the same bank, but the source row is in this subway and the destination row is in this subway. Well, unfortunately, there is no internal connectivity between these subways. Again, interconnect is lacking. As a result, what this paper initially, uh, what this paper proposes, okay, take the source row, write it to an empty row in some other bank, and then get the data from that bank and write it to the destination row in the same subway. Basically, we're going to use another bank as the intermediate temporary location for a row that's going to be copied. Again, the granularity uh, doesn't have to be a row over here, uh, uh, but again, you need to go to another bank over here. Okay. So clearly this is not desirable, even though these subways are very close to each other, we're going to another bank, right? Just because the connectivity is not there. So we're gonna have a solution to this. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about some other work. Uh, but all of these changes require very little area cost in DM, 0.01%, according to calculations of this work. And clearly they give you heterogeneous latency and energy savings. As I mentioned, the best case is intra-subway. Intra-subway is unfortunately worse. You don't gain latency savings as you can see over here. But you do gain energy savings. Not a lot. It's about 30%, as you can see over here, a little over 30%. Uh, so there may be a reason to do it still, but uh, you can see that data mapping becomes really important here. So I'm going to later show you a mechanism that reduces this inter subway actually a lot, somewhere around here and somewhere around here. Uh, we will talk about that. Uh, so it becomes better. But still, there's some heterogeneity, as you can see, right? Uh, so the, you, ideally, you, in order to get the best benefits, you would like to do row granularity copies, and you would like to do it within a sub same subway. So your destination page needs to be allocated in the same subway as the source page, which means that if you're, uh, your, your memory allocator or software needs to be aware of where the subways are, where things are allocated in which subways, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to be aware of the topology of the EM. We discussed this before. There's another reason why uh, it's important for software to be aware of what the UM looks like and do the allocation in a performance aware and energy aware manner. There's no uh, other way to get around this in my opinion. You need to enable some sort of awareness uh, of uh, data mapping to higher level software in this case. And that's, this is going to come up, come up and up in all of processing in memory discussions that we have. Now, this is not something new in a sense, right? Uh, for example, if you want to write a good program on a GPU that executes fast, you would like to minimize bank conflicts, right? This is, this is, there's some similarity to that. In order to be able to do that, you need to know which, uh, where your data structures are mapped in your, inside your memory. Okay, you don't go into the subway level, uh, clearly, but you do go into the bank level. So there's some resemblance uh, to existing accelerators. In order to get best out of existing accelerators like GPUs, you need to know how to do data mapping well. And that's true, I believe, in terms of main uh, in-memory computation as well. Okay, uh, for example, if the GPUs had a way of taking advantage of subways, and I believe there could be actually going into the future, uh, then I think GPUs would be aware, uh, aware of subways also. GPU programmers could be aware of subways also, or at least the operating systems, or at least the virtualization layers that do memory allocation. Okay, so initialization I talked about, but basically you can do past row initialization. You can set one row to zero. This is similar to setting a register, for example, to zero because zero initialization is very common. As a result, some ISAs like MIPS set, uh, R30, sets R32 to zero. And whenever you need a zero, you just reference R32, right? Here, you can also fit, uh, fix a row in DM uh, in a subway to zero. It leads to very small loss in capacity, in fact, less than 0 0.5 because zero is hardwired. As you, as you know, you can actually be very clever about this. But now if you want to copy this row to another row, you just do what I just discussed, two consecutive activates. Activate this and activate the destination. And activate the destination. So in fact, you can do one activate to the source row and then you can do uh, consecutive activates to all of the destination rows. So you can initialize an entire subarray with 512 activates, assuming the size of the subarray is 512, right? Okay, so that's the idea over here. And this leads to, uh, okay, if you want to initialize the arbitrary data, then you write, you pay the penalty of writing to an entire row, and then you can copy the data to other rows if you do it uh, intra subarray clearly. Clear zero initialization is most common. And then if you do uh, initialization, you get 6x lower latency and 41.5x lower DM energy compared to doing it through the memory controller. 
Okay, so hopefully this gives you an idea. And I believe initialization is actually a no-brainer in a sense, right? A copy, okay, you may have some uh, doubts. Okay, am I going to reuse the data? But if you're initializing a one terabyte database uh, and you're not going to reuse the data anytime soon, why not do it using row clone inside the memory and make it 6x lower latency and 41x lower DRAM energy? Okay, so this summarizes the latency and energy benefits as proposed by this paper. You can see that the best is over here, copy. Zeroing is still very good. Uh, Interbank and intersubway, there are some benefits. In, in this case, there is no benefits. But energy you always gain because you don't move the data outside the DRAM chip in any of these mechanisms. Okay, and this heterogeneous uh, benefits uh, clearly lead to uh, 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 questions as to how can we take advantage of this heterogeneity such that we can maximize the benefits. Okay. So uh, the paper covers some workloads. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can read the paper. Maybe it's going to be one of the assigned readings. Uh, uh, in fact, I would recommend it as a, a reading because we're going to talk a lot about this today. Uh, essentially, we look at some workloads like fork, memcached, MySQL database, compilation, boot up in Linux. And we see that there's significant amount of zero and copy that is done in these workloads fractional, in terms of fractional memory traffic. Uh, and uh, if you actually use row clone, in them, you get significant performance, instructions for cycle improvement and energy reduction. Uh, and the improvements are commensurate with the fraction of uh, memory traffic that's caused by zeros and copies. For example, these two workloads don't have as much. As a result, they gain less. These two workloads have a lot. As a result, they gain more. So, okay, this is uh, just a validation, I guess. Uh, this is, of course, done in simulation, uh, but you can read the paper for more detail. So at the application level, you get significant benefits also, as you can see, right? Okay, so let's talk about uh, the system design for it. Feel free to ask any questions on chat, or again, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions. And they're, they're very good questions, as you remember from last time. Uh, let's keep them coming if you have questions. Uh, okay, so uh, this slide is going to be a description of uh, any in-memory computation engine, let's say. Whenever you want to have some computation, in this case, it's data copy and utilization, even with such small changes to the EM, you really need to do an end-to-end -end system design. Basically, you cannot get away from this. <laughs> Somehow, the application needs to communicate the occurrences of bulk copy and initialization across layers, such that you could actually do them inside the DRAM, right? This is important. Uh, there needs to be some interface to the ISA, clearly, such that the application says, oh, I want to do a row clone. How do you do that? Now, fortunately, uh, memory copy and memory initialization is already uh, inside the ISAs. So for example, x86 ISA has move s. Uh, and you could add, add a repeat prefix to it. Move s is move string. And you could, you could actually have arbitrary lengths of strings as long as you set up some of your input registers correctly uh, to, uh, to the move s. And because it has move s, it has operands as some counter register, for example, and a beginning register uh, source register, which, which points to the source of the array, and the destination register, which points to the destination uh, location in memory to copy the array to. And there's a counter register that basically says how many bytes are supposed to be copied. So x86 is actually very nicely set up for this, at least for a uh, row clone, let's say. Uh, but if you don't have such instructions in your ISA, you'll need to add them somehow. And we will talk about that also later on, right? What is the general interface for this? Uh, okay, so for, we're, we're a bit locked out over here because this is such a common operation that people actually added the stuff into the ISAs already. Okay, the next step thing is, uh, one of the next things is how do you ensure cache coherence? This is important actually. Uh, so whenever you're doing copies of a page, uh, the, both the source and destination pages may actually have uh, data inside the caches. How do you ensure that, that uh, you don't become incoherent because some of the data is cached inside the processor's caches, right? And this is important. The paper has a solution over here. Basically, what the paper does is it says, okay, we're going to use the same mechanism as the direct memory access engines. In direct memory access engines, the same issue arises. If you actually offload the copy and initialization to a direct memory access engine sitting in the memory controller, same, same problem arises. The CPU caches may have cached the source or destination pages, right? Or, or, or a fraction of those pages. Even a single cache block, right, uh, from one of those pages, right? As a result, you need to actually probe uh, the caches and figure out uh, whether anything is cached and flush the data to memory before you do the copies. Okay, this is costly, clearly. 
the paper takes this into account. Uh, and this is a hairy issue, clearly, whenever you do in-memory processing. And keep this in mind. This will arise over and over whenever we do in-memory computation. This will arise, this already, already arises in CPUs and GPUs, for example. If you're doing operations on, uh, if you want the C GPU to operate on some data, you need to transfer the data to GPU memory. Uh, but uh, while doing that, you need to ensure coherence somehow, because you may actually have a copy of that data inside the caches. And if you concurrently update that copy, while the GPU is operating on that copy, well, too bad. <laughs> you may actually have an incoherent state. So later in these lectures, hopefully we will talk about coherence mechanisms. Uh, you, may, you may have been exposed to these in some other uh, class, uh, like operating systems, for example, or parallel programming. Uh, but we're gonna go into the hardware layers of cache coherence and see how this operates. Uh, but that could be one potential solution as we will discuss, but uh, there are a lot of overheads associated with this. So it's a hairy problem in in-memory processing. One thing, uh, uh, essentially the programmer may need to deal with it. Uh, and in this case, programmer deals with it basically whenever you're doing DMA, direct memory access engine, the programmer needs to ensure that uh, the DMA engine actually has uh, the right permissions, let's say. Basically, you don't run into coherence issues. Okay, we're gonna get back to this. Uh, keep this in mind. But these are some of the system level issues that are needed to enable even something as simple as low, low flow. The next one is how do you, uh, something we discussed, how do you maximize latency and energy savings? Basically, how do you design an operating system and a memory allocator that cooperates with the microarchitecture such that whenever you want to do a copy, whenever the application wants to do a copy, uh, you actually allocate the destination page to uh, the same subarray as a source page. Okay, clearly this requires cooperation across the stack, right? And that uh, it becomes, I don't wanna call it problematic, it's a good opportunity, but that, that makes things like this harder to adopt. Okay, this is important, I think. And the last one is how do you handle data reuse? For example, if you actually do the copy always in memory, you may actually lose performance because the page that you have copied may actually be needed right away, right? And if it's needed right away, you, uh, you do the, did the copy only inside the ma main memory, well, the data is not in the CPU where CPU is, is going to access it. Now you need, the CPU gets, starts getting cache misses, right? So this is important and uh, balancing this is important. Uh, so the paper talks about this briefly, which I'm not going to go into, but one way of handling this could be predicting where to do this operation, right? Or predicting which cache blocks you're going to need after this operation is done, such that you could actually take those, look, take those cache blocks and put it inside the CPU's caches, right? So clearly there are many, many very, very interesting questions over here and these questions all come about uh, whenever you do in-memory processing. And the paper has some answers to them. I'm not gonna go through them in detail. There are actually more questions than what is discussed over here. And I will discuss some of them when I talk about details in a little bit. Okay, so this is the paper that introduced Roklong. You can see that it's about seven years ago. Uh, uh, and uh, let's talk about uh, the mindset of, of it. And again, feel free to ask questions. So the mindset of Roklong is very simple, as you can see. It's just copying and initializing data by modifying memory slightly. It's an accelerator. It's an accelerator for copy and initialization operations. And we know how to design many, many accelerators, as you can see over here. Today, there are different types of cores. Uh, all of you have some sort of video and audio accelerators in your cell phones, for example. All of you have some GPUs in your cell phones, machines. Uh, there are many different other types of accelerators, machine learning accelerators. Some of you may have machine learning accelerators in your cell phones. I probably don't because my cell phone is five plus years old. But some of you actually may have it right now, especially if you bought it recently uh, or within the last two years or so. Uh, so there are many, many accelerators that, you ha that we have today that are sitting on the left side of the memory bus, clearly, right? Basically, the proposal is to add an accelerator on the right side of the memory bus. So all of these accelerators on the left side of the memory bus have a common problem, which is they're bottlenecked by the memory bus. They don't have access to a very large amount of memory at high bandwidth, at low latency and low energy. So they're bottlenecked. Whereas this accelerator over here, like Roll Clone, is not bottlenecked. It's, it's basically inside the memory, right? As a result, it doesn't have that bottleneck. But there, as I mentioned earlier, there are similar issues in terms of programming. Programming models may potentially be similar between GPUs and the accelerators over here, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I'm not gonna go into that, but essentially uh, memory is now treated similarly to a conventional accelerator. 
And the premise of processing in memory or near data processing is why don't we consider specialized accelerators or even general purpose accelerators, general purpose meaning it could be cores over here, uh, that are on the other side of the memory bus, meaning on uh, the memory side, such that these accelerators have high, high bandwidth, low latency, low energy access to large amounts of memory. That's the idea of row clock. Okay, now let me analyze this work uh, a little bit. Uh, I mean, if you've taken the seminar course, we've done some of this. Uh, we've gone through the papers in much more detail, but uh, I, I would like to give an analysis of uh, the strengths and weaknesses of this work because you're gonna review some papers uh, for this course uh, as well. In fact, some, uh, some of them are already assigned. It's good to see um, uh, me do it. I'm not gonna go uh, do it in every uh, idea that we discuss, but keep in mind that every idea that we discuss have these trade-offs. Uh, at least I'm not gonna do it to the level that I'm going to do it uh, in this work over here. So let me talk about the paper and the work, basically the strengths. Essentially, row clone is a simple novel mechanism to solve an important problem. And this could be a perfectly, perfect strength that you can discuss whenever you read papers, for example. It's effective and low hardware overheads. Hopefully I've convinced you of that even you without, without you reading the paper. It's an intuitive idea. Uh, in fact, it was surprising to us that something like this was not published until 2013. It's, it's very intuitive. And in general, intuitive ideas are better than others. Simple ideas are better than others. It greatly improves performance and efficiency, clearly, as I showed you, assuming data is mapped nicely in the same subarray as we've discussed. And it seems like a clear win for data initialization. You don't even need to map the data carefully. Wherever your data is, you want to initialize it. You don't even need to think about data mapping. You just initialize it with row clock. Very simple, as you can see over here. You still need to handle coherence, unfortunately, but uh, it seems like a clear win for data initialization. It makes software li designers' life easier. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 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 well, I, I will mention a little bit, but if, uh, ask the question to yourself. If copies are 10 to 100x cheaper or more energy efficient, how do we design software? Uh, so let me give you an anecdote over here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, VMware is a place that does a lot of copies, right? Uh, whenever you do uh, virtual machine boot up, virtual machine copying, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, forking of applications inside a virtual machine, killing of applications inside a virtual machine, you need to initialize stuff also, uh, et cetera. Uh, you're doing either copying or initialization. Let's, let's consider copying. Uh, so uh, these folks realized that copy is a big bottleneck in their performance, and they redesigned a lot of the virtual machine software to do what's called a zero copy, meaning they want to avoid copies like the plague <laughs> or COVID-19, let's say. Uh, plague was... Uh, Plague is to COVID-19 uh, as the 19th century is uh, to our century right now, right? Uh, but basically, they wanted to avoid uh, copies like the plague, so they redesigned their software significantly to get rid of copies as much as possible. They couldn't get rid of all of the copies, but they could get rid of some. And they, for, that, uh, for, for them, that was a win. But what, uh, what was the cost of this? Essentially, the cost of it was actually a... a software that was very hard to maintain and very hard to read also. I read some of that code and it's very hard to read and it's, it's very hard to maintain. Very few people really, really understand it. And if you would like to change it, it takes a lot of effort to change it. So basically these folks made the design choice to change their software significantly because copies were very expensive. And as a result, the software became less maintainable, less changeable uh, and less good in some metric, right? It was good in performance, but it was less good in terms of many, many other metrics that we should judge software uh, for. So I believe these sort of hardware acceleration mechanisms are an example of what could make the software designer's life much easier. And the software designer may now make the trade off, okay, this copy, it's not taking that much time, so I don't care about it. So let me move on. Let me just do the copy, right? So there is a much better world of designing better software if the hardware is actually providing the right primitives for what the software is trying to do. And clearly there's a precedent that showed that, okay, this is important. Copy initialization is important. I've given you multiple papers and I've given you a real life anecdote as well uh, on this topic. Okay, so uh, I think uh, th that's where uh, uh, this sort of processing in memory is, could be very helpful, right? Uh, and that's where accelerators are very, very important also because accelerators at some level make software designers' life easier also. Uh, 
uh, for another example is uh, if you have a if you're doing video encoding and decoding uh, you need to do motion estimation because motion estimation enables you to actually encode consecutive frames uh, in a much more packed manner in a much more compressed manner uh, and you could actually even start operating uh, on the frames in some way if you're doing predictive uh, video for example which you might be doing uh, if you're playing online games for example uh, but this motion estimation again turns out to be uh, extremely slow uh, if you do it purely in software and people design many many algorithms for it etc uh, to accelerate it but if you actually bake in a very fast motion estimator inside your hardware that's configurable enough for your software of course then uh, the software designers might become uh, actually, it might, uh, software designers, my, uh, life might become much easier. So somebody's asking, is it possible to take a break? Yes, we're going to take a break, but I would like to uh, do it uh, at the end of this uh, work, let's say. Uh, and then we're going to take a 15-minute break. Okay, so a paper tackles many low-level and system-level issues, uh, and it's a well-written, insightful paper. So it's good to, whenever you're reviewing a paper, I would suggest going through the strengths of the paper this way, and then uh, uh, discussing them. Uh, from most important to least important. So there was actually, uh, you can see that I, I started with the mechanism itself. And I believe this is the ordering. Of course, you can argue maybe some of this ordering is more important. But uh, the papers, uh, I put these uh, well-written and insightful to the very end. Okay, let's talk about weaknesses now. Uh, as I mentioned, it requires data to be mapped in the same subarray to deliver the largest benefits. It helps less if data movement is not within a subarray. It doesn't help if data movement is across the EM channels. Uh, clearly, it's not something targeted by this paper, right? And that's something that you should think of. If you're moving data across the EM channels, across different memory controllers, how do you actually handle it? And this mechanism is not going to handle it, and that's a tougher problem. And there are not many mechanisms that can handle it well. You need better, much better interconnects, for example. Okay, inter subarray copy is very inefficient, as we've discussed. This causes many changes in the system stack. Uh, and it, it leads to an end to end design span. Uh, that spans applications to circuits. So this is a negative clearly for adoption, right? It's great for research perhaps, and it's, it's clearly disruptive thinking. That's why this is why it's happening. But clearly this is an adoption problem. So it's always good to ask how easy to adopt this idea. This doesn't mean that the paper should be rejected. And we are gonna talk about some of that also in a little bit. Uh, but uh, this means that uh, adoption will be difficult. So people need to consider adoption issues. Uh, and again, uh, as I mentioned, software hardware cooperative solution that spans application circuit might not always be easy to adopt. There are cache coherence and data reuse issues that will cause real overheads, and those are accounted for, and th they need to be accounted for for a realistic evaluation of the benefits. You could say evaluation is done only in simulation. Again, this could be a weakness, but again, modifying the DRM chips is not easy in uh, today's systems. You're going to see more and more of this as we discuss processing in memory, we'll see a lot of simulation. And simulation is a key tool of the architect as we will also discuss, because you can actually see what kind of dreams you have and you can actually evaluate your dreams. But again, if you needed to build hardware for every single idea that you came up with, then uh, your idea throughput would be extremely low. And you may not be able to actually build hardware uh, that is satisfactory enough. So as an architect, it's very important to do simulation. That's why we, you actually have simulation labs to test ideas. And this becomes even more important as you uh, examine issues like processing in memory because building hardware for this is actually a lot of investment. You can see that even companies uh, cannot do that investment as easily. Okay, evaluation does not consider multi-chip systems and that's also true. And are these the best workloads to evaluate? So you can see that I'm getting into rattles at this point perhaps. So. Uh, workload clearly, metrics and configuration and details. Uh, these are things that you should be careful about. Clearly a paper cannot evaluate everything and you should not judge the paper based on what it's uh, evaluated, but also, uh, but more, more importantly, the ideas that it can enable. Okay, so let me briefly uh, talk about some um, extension and follow-up work. I'm not gonna go into details of this, but essentially there's follow-up work that happened that showed that this could be improved to do faster inter-survey copy. We're gonna talk about the LISA paper later on uh, but uh, this is called low-cost interlinked subarrays. Can we enable data moment at smaller granularities within a bank? And the answer is also yes. With uh, uh, the figure a paper that's coming up in micro, which you may be exposed to in the future, is another uh, idea, uh, which is a cool idea, I think. Can this be improved to be do better interbank copy? Again, uh, there's another work that talks about uh, doing interbank copies by adding more connectivity, essentially, 
uh, between banks by having a logic layer that connects the banks. This is called network on memory. Essentially adding more connectivity inside the memory enables better interbank copies such that you can access some banks while doing copies between some other banks. And finally, can similar ideas and DM properties be used to perform computation on data? And the answer again is yes, and we're gonna talk about this paper in a little bit. So this is the LISA paper. Uh, let me give you the basic idea of this. Essentially, the basic idea is these subways are not connected to each other. Let's connect them. Well, they're, con they're connected to each other via the internal data bus that spans the banks. Uh, and low connectivity is a fundamental problem that, uh, uh, that causes uh, the inter, inter subway, but within bank data movement to be very slow. So uh, the idea is to provide a new substrate to enable wider connectivity between the subways. And that's the LISA paper. I'm, I'm gonna go into detail of this later on, but basically let me give you the key idea very quickly pictorially, because I think the key idea can be understood relatively well. Essentially, you have bit lines inside the subway. You have bit lines inside the subway. They're not connected to each other today. The idea is to add connectors to those bit lines such that the bit lines of the subways are connected to each other. And you can have, these are called isolation transistors. And you can enable these isolation transistors to ensure that the subways are connected to each other. Or you can disable these isolation transistors such that the subways are disconnected from each other. And this enables data movement from this subway to another subway. And this, that reduces the copy latency significantly between subways. As you can see, it's a lot. It's getting closer to actually row clone intra subway. Uh, and uh, it enables other things that we will discuss later on. It enables NDM caching. For example, you could use this subway as a cache for another subway. And you could, do, you could actually enable fast pre-charge also by uh, pre-charging one subway from both directions. Okay, so if you're interested, you can look at this paper. This is the Figaro paper that I mentioned. This is a network on memory paper. And this is the bulk bitwise operation papers that we're going to talk about next. Okay, but let's talk about, uh, can this idea be evaluated on a real system? We're gonna talk about this paper later on when we talk about AMBIT, but, and the idea, again, the, uh, the, uh, it's yes, there are some papers that, uh, there's one paper that showed that you could actually do row clone in off the shelf DRAM chips that you can buy today. We're gonna to talk about that briefly. And can similar ideas be used in other types of memories? Space change memory, RAM, STT RAM, and yes, there's a paper published in 2016 in DEC that shows that you could do something like row clone uh, in, and also AMBIT also in phase change memory and RAM. And also I think there's more extensions that could come up, like can we have more efficient solutions to cache coherence and data reviews after copy and initialization. And these are the papers that I mentioned, uh, doing row clone in PCM and also bitwise operations, and also doing row clone uh, in real DRAM chips. Okay, so let me give you some takeaways and I'm going to also talk about some of the reviews that we received uh, uh, and then we can uh, basically take a break. So basically, this is a new method to accelerate data copy initialization. It's simple and effective, it's hardware software cooperative and clearly there's good potential for work building on it to extend it to different granularities to make things more efficient and eff effective and there's a lot of work that built on it clearly. And easy to read and understand also. And this is, I think, one of the first simple examples of thinking of memory as an accelerator. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about India and about bitwise operations. So actually, I think this is a, probably a good place to stop. Uh, uh, I was thinking of also going through the row clone, but uh, uh, that will take some time. Uh, so maybe I'm going to do the row clone and they unbot bitwise and operations together uh, uh, when we talk about uh, some of the criticisms that you can potentially get in terms of uh, uh, against ideas like this. Okay, so it, unless there are any burning questions, it's a good place to stop. Uh, and this is actually a good time to stop also. So it's 2.44 right now. Let's be back at three. And then we're going to continue uh, after that. Okay, so we left off, uh, we finished row clone. Uh, and uh, remember, this was the mentality basically. We're going to look at memory as an accelerator uh, similar to a conventional accelerator, except it's sitting on the right side of the bus. But you can, you can argue that row clone, okay, is cheating. It's a copying and initialization. We're not doing any operation or computation, right? Well, copying and initialization is important, actually. It's preparing the data for computation. But yes, it'd be nice if we can also do computation inside DRAM as well. And I'm going to basically follow the similar line of thought. Can we actually use the existing DRAM cells and existing interconnect inside the DRAM to enable some sort of logic operations. And that's going to bring us to what's called AMBIT basically. 
Uh, essentially, uh, in addition to copying, zeroing, initialization, we can support and or not a majority in DUM. And we're going to see how that is the case. And it can be a low cost. And the idea is to use the analog computation capability of DUM. Uh, we're going to activate multiple rows, and this is going to perform computation. Remember, consecutively activating two rows enabled us to copy data from one to another. Concurrently activating three rows will enable us to actually build a majority function, bitwise majority function, which could be expressed as a bitwise AND and a bitwise OR function also. So that's the idea over here, which is very simple. And you can actually extend this idea potentially to concurrently activating N rows and see what kind of functions you can potentially get. And there's some work that has looked at, also, looked at it also in some other uh, context. But basically, we will get significant performance energy improvements in these operations. And this is the paper that was published. I'm going to tell you stories about these papers also so that you're aware uh, of uh, these ideas and uh, uh, we'll talk about them basically. Uh, and on top of this, new memory technologies enable even more opportunities. So we're going to talk about emerging memory technologies uh, in a later lecture. But these technologies can operate on data uh, without data movement also. For example, in DRAM, you need to do some sort of minimal data movement. Uh, essentially, you cannot just operate on the data. If, whenever you activate a row, uh, you destroy the row, right? Because you, you basically read the cells and then uh, you, amplify, you need to amplify them. And if you want to actually do some operation on them, you need to copy the original data somewhere else, essentially. Whereas new memory technologies are non-volatile, their reads are by definition not destructive. As a result, I think they can do operations uh, on uh, data with minimal data movement, essentially. And there are many of them, we'll talk about them. Uh, and I think this is, this is very exciting, in fact, uh, some of the ideas that I described are applicable to phase change memory. As I discussed, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, toward the end of this lecture. Uh, but also, uh, new memory technologies can enable matrix multiplication in place as well. Basically, uh, they, can, they can do matrix operations uh, using this crossbar array. So essentially, they're array-based, and uh, the, the resistances uh, that they uh, output can be a function of the input resistances or input currents uh, that are uh, put into the circuit from different parts of the crossbar. As a result, you can actually do analog matrix computations in them. And as a result, these, te uh, these technologies are uh, currently being very, very heavily investigated as potential accelerators for machine learning. Uh, because you can keep the data or keep the weights, uh, for example, of your neural network inside uh, a resistor RAM structure, and then you can pass some of the inputs. And while you're doing that, you can essentially calculate uh, what your network is supposed to calculate because essentially what these resistive RAMs can do is uh, matrix multiplications that are done a lot in neural networks. Okay, I simplified it quite a bit, but essentially by manipulating uh, the inputs and the uh, data that's stored in these resistive uh, RAMs, you can actually get uh, analog computation uh, that gives you multiplication, for example. Here we talked about copying and initialization, where you can get multiplication of values in, uh, in some of these analog uh, memory, uh, analog resistive memories. Okay, uh, that's enough for now. We may actually talk about some of the works in this area. Uh, I think it's fascinating and I think it's very good to uh, enable works in that area also. So I'm, I'm very optimistic even though there are challenges clearly in terms of technology to make this happen really. But if we can make it happen, uh, and if we can have both architectures and algorithms to make it happen, uh, then I think this could be very good. Okay, there's one uh, question. Uh, would it be easier to implement things like row clone for companies like Nvidia or Apple that control a big part of the stack? Do they already do things like this? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, do, they already, uh, do they already do things like this? I'm not sure. Uh, they might be doing internally in, inside their caches, for example, and never telling anyone. That's possible. They may be keeping it as trade secret, or they may have a patent like this. Uh, that's possible. Uh, I believe it's possible because they actually optimize. Uh, I know both companies optimize a lot uh, to get highest performance clearly. Uh, clearly, they're leading companies in their respective domains. Uh, so I cannot answer the question, are they already doing it? Uh, but if they're doing it, they're probably doing it inside their caches. I don't think they're doing it in DRAM. 
because for DRAM, I think you need support from the vendors to provide some reliability guarantees, I think, for this sort of operation. Uh, so that's a very good question, though. Uh, I don't think it's easy for them to do uh, in DRAM because clearly they don't control the DRAM part of the stack, right? And this is unfortunate because if, if a company like them controlled the DRAM part of the stack, uh, they might have been doing in-memory computation by now, actually. So I agree with you that it's a lot easier for vertically integrated companies. But unfortunately, uh, there's, uh, with one exception, there's, uh, well, there's no vertically integrated company uh, that controls a large chunk of the stack inclu that, in that includes DRAM, basically. Now, uh, there's one exception that I was going to talk about, which is really Samsung, right? If you look at Samsung, it's a company that does memory as well as logic. Uh, now, uh, I think they're actually uh, the best positioned company to do something like what we described, row clone, and also some even aggressive optimizations uh, for computation memory that we will describe later on. But unfortunately, the mindset, uh, as far as I understand, the mindset is not there. So if you look at Samsung, it's a huge company. It's divided into these divisions. There's a memory division, and then there's an SOC division, which are good at what they do individually but I don't think they actually talk to each other. <laughs> As a result, uh, uh, maybe they don't uh, do uh, things like row clone or something else. Of course, I don't know in the end if they do or not, but if they were doing it, I would, uh, if, if I were them and if I were doing it, I would be selling it. <laughs> so I don't think they're doing it in the end. So that's a very good question. So if you, if you come up with a vertically integrated company in the future, make sure you include DRAM and, or some sort of really good memory. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I believe Samsung is even stronger than that because they also have SSDs, right? So they can essentially do uh, the entire computing stack. Maybe they're not as good at the application layers. That's the downside, of course. Uh, and that may be the reason why they're not actually seeing uh, the light, if you will, to vertically integrate. As a result, I think they are less vertically integrated than some of the other companies that you mentioned over here. Okay. Uh, so that, I think that's, uh, that also points to the fact that we should really be uh, thinking ac across the stack because I think if you, if you have thinking that's not across the stack, maybe like if you're not thinking applications as well as circuits uh, and how you can enable different things across, across the stack, maybe you will be missing opportunities. And I, I seriously believe that uh, some of the companies are missing opportunities because they have the capability and they're not doing it. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, that's a good question. So let me go back uh, to Ambit, basically. As I said, new memory technologies have even more possibilities and some of the companies we discussed, like Samsung, again, is investing a lot into new memory technologies. And I think they're also in a good position to enable things like this, but we will see uh, how, how it pans out. Uh, I think new memory technology is very interesting because there are many players uh, in that domain. So in that sense, it's a little bit more free compared to DRAM. Although this, is, this requires a lot of investment, clearly, to enable a new memory technology and a lot of manufacturing investment, for example. Uh, as a result, it's not going to be easy for any company uh, to actually have a really, really good memory technology that uh, enables, uh, let's say, comp uh, matrix multiplication inside the memory uh, going forward. Okay, so now we're back to Ambit. Uh, so what's the idea in Ambit? Essentially, we want to concurrently activate three rows. And here I show you the picture of three rows, one bit line. Imagine a row being eight kilobytes, let's say. And imagine uh, uh, you, you have uh, 1,000 subarrays. So what I'm going to describe next can be done in eight million bits uh, in one cycle, one DRAM cycle, uh, assuming you have enough power to power up uh, that sort of operation, of course, right? Uh, that's the idea, basically. Uh, but the idea is triple row activation. We do a triple row activation inside uh, for these ABC. And if you do that, that means that you concurrently connect uh, these capacitors to the bit line. Now, in an ideal circuit, what should happen is uh, ignore all of the variation, circuit level variations for now. Uh, in an ideal circuit, what should happen and what you can build the circuit to make happen is uh, if at least two of these cells are charged, you get the charge state at the end. If at least two of these cells are discharged, you get the discharge state at the end. Basically, you have a bitwise majority function. Why? Because assume that uh, these cells are all equal. Uh, what happens is if at least two of these are, cells are charged, they perturb the bit line to a positive point like this. 
if at least two of them are discharged, they perturb the bit line to a negative value, less than VDD. And then sense amplifier kicks in and does its job. In this case, it amplifies the bit line to VDD and this becomes zero. And then the cells all get filled with VDD, as you can see, right? So I just showed you how bitwise majority function operates in three cells. And bitwise majority function looks like this in Boolean algebra, as all of you know. So this is great, actually. Bitwise majority is a very interesting function. You could, uh, if possible, you could translate a good chunk of your algorithm to bulk bitwise majority, because you're not doing bitwise majority on, on, on a single bit. You're doing it on 8 million bits concurrently in a single DM chip. And if you're using multiple DM chips, you're do, doing it on n times uh, 8, 8 million bits. So this is actually very powerful, as you can see. If you can translate your algorithm to a sequence of bitwise majority functions, that's also great, right? In fact, there's work at uh, EPFL that looks at logic synthesis using bitwise majority functions. If you're interested in logic synthesis and bitwise majority, I would recommend looking into that. So they have a flow for doing logic synthesis by translating logic synthesis to bitwise majority functions, which is very interesting. So you could actually build even compilers to compile your algorithm into bitwise majority functions, assuming, of course, your algorithm is written in an amenable way to begin with. So this is good. Uh, but again, uh, bitwise majority is not something many of you think of probably. Uh, maybe after this, you're going to think of it. But uh, you can think of and and nots, uh, and and ors, right? So if you rewrite this equation, take out C, with simple Boolean rewriting, you get, if, you, if C is set to one, you get the or of A and B. If C is set to zero, you get the and of A and B. So now this is becoming interesting, right? Which means that you can set C to one or zero to control what happens to the result. If you set C to one, you get the or of A and B here. If you set C to zero, you get the and of A and B, which is good. You can do bit bulk bitwise and and, not, and or, or. And that's the idea, which is great. Now you can also expose it to the ISA, right? You can ask, uh, I mean, I think this is kind of trivial, but it's good to know how this can be done. Basically, you can have an operation like this in your ISA, bulk and A and B, rows A and B, and store the result into C. Perform a bitwise end of two rows A and B and store the result into C, in row C. Now, if you read the ambit paper, clearly uh, in a subarray, you don't want to enable concurrent triple row activation for every possible combination of three rows. This is not a good idea. Why not? Because now you need to have three row decoders. And row decoders are very, very expensive in DRAM because this is really logic. So what the paper proposed is actually this. Basically, you have a reserved zero row. You have a reserved one row, all set, one, set to ones. These don't occupy a lot of area because you can actually optimize it to get rid of uh, like a good chunk of the capacitor. You don't really need capacitor to store zeros in this case, but you can do something different here. Uh, and uh, and you also, there's also a designated area of the subarray, uh, which is special. And these are the rows that are specially designed to perform triple row activation. So they have a special row decoder that's separate from the subarray that houses data. That's the idea over here. So if you look at the ambit paper, you will see that these are in a special place uh, in, uh, in the row decoder. Actually, I, I, I might share my screen very quickly uh, to find the ambit paper. Let's see. Uh, you're not seeing my screen at this point, I assume, right? You're still seeing the slides. Any feedback? Okay, it's still, okay, thanks. It's delayed feedback, but that's good. <laughs> as long as it comes. Okay, now let me open up the ambit paper and I'll show you uh, what, I, what I'm describing very quickly. Uh, and then I'll switch to Okay, I guess I'll need to stop sharing. It's a bit cumbersome. Stop sharing, screen share, and bit paper is there, I can see it. That's good. Okay, so now you're seeing the screen, that's good. Uh, so okay, this is basically what the paper suggests. Uh, you, you augment a regular subarray with some group of rows. Now ignore some of the other ones over here, uh, but essentially 
uh, we're going to augment it with, uh, oh, now you're not seeing my slides, very interesting, uh, with, with some number of extra rows. <laughs> I guess I could share my ex uh, full screen, but then you'll see uh, both, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out later. Basically, you have a separate area in the subarray that's special with different number of rows. Ideally, you would you you just need well ideal not ideally in the bare minimum you just need three rows, but of course Ambit adds some more other stuff uh, for uh, uh, other things to make things faster and also uh, to to take the complement, uh, but I, I'm going to ignore that for now. We're going to talk about that later. But basically, you need three rows. Ambit calls it T zero, T one, T two. In the in the slides, I call it D one, D two, D three. I think we'll get back to that. Uh, and this row decoder can be very simple. Uh, so that you don't need to have uh, another big row decoder. And you certainly don't need to have three row decoders, right? If you were able to do this triple array activation arbitrarily in any row in the subarray, you need three row decoders to be able to activate three things. Not good. Now you can actually design this very, very specially. So it's a very specialized design in a sense, but it's not really also disturbing the existing subarray much. That's the idea over here. Okay, we may get back to this paper, so I'll... Uh, keep it open, but uh, let me go to, okay, there it is, the slides. Okay, basically we have these three designated rows, which were the T0, T1, T3 in the paper, uh, and we're going to use those three designated rows. Okay. Okay, uh, so what me this means that whenever you have rows A and B and C, uh, you need to copy them. Right, so I'm going to show you basically bulk and A, B, uh, write the result into C, requires a sequence of operations. First, you need to row clone row A into this designated row D1 in that special area of the subarray. And this is just row clone, nothing changes here. And then row clone row B into the, des another, the second designated row, D2. And then row clone R0, resort 0 row, because we're going to do an end, uh, into D3, the third designated row. So you see that row clone and Ambit go hand in hand, right? Because you need to copy the data so that you can do the triple row activation after that. And then you do the triple row activation, which is a very simple command saying triple row activation. And because we know exactly which designated rows are going to be activated, we don't need to say which rows are going to be activated because they're already designated to do triple row activation in the subarray. You just need to specify the subarray. Now the result is in the bit lines and also in D1, D2, D3. So you can copy any of them or row clone any of them, D1, D2, or D3, into uh, the destination row C. So that's the idea. So to be able to do this bot bitwise end, we need to do four row clones plus one activate, which is not bad. An Ambit paper actually uh, gives the results of how long it takes. It's much faster than how fast you can do uh, all of this in a CPU by bringing the data. And it's also much higher bandwidth. So even though you, you need to do row clones, these are intra-subarray intra row clones, right? So you can see that how we're build, build, building primitives for in-memory computation. Without row clone, this is not possible to do. I mean, it is possible to do, but it's going to be extremely uh, intrusive to the DRAM structure because you would be doing direct activate uh, to three rows concurrently, and that's not going to fly very well. Okay, so if you want to learn more about uh, in DRAM, Balkan, and Ord, we, we published this actually as a short paper first uh, because we wanted to get the idea out at that time, we didn't know how to do the not. Uh, and basically, the shortcoming is that if you do and and or, you're not functionally complete, right? To be functionally complete, you need an and, or nor, or a combination of not and one of and or or, right? <laughs> and if you actually implement not in DM, then uh, we already have and and or, so now you can become functionally complete. Now, what does functionally complete mean? Functionally complete means that you can actually implement any uh, circ hardware algorithm on it, right? That's the idea. Which means that as long as you can translate your program uh, to a hardware algorithm, to a, to a Boolean algorithm, you can implement anything, right? And that's the idea. That's, that's why it becomes very powerful. Now you become functionally complete. You should be able to implement anything as long as you can do the translation, right? That's the idea. Okay, so how do we get not? Uh, or, or the question could be, how do we get NAND? How do we get NOR? It turns out NAND and NOR, in my opinion, are not easy in DRAM, uh, at least not as easy as not. Uh, but it turns out there are some memory technologies where NOR is very good. For example, in some sort of RAM, resistive RAM, 
uh, you can do NOR. Uh, and there's work that's uh, basically built everything on top of NOR logic. Now, once you could do, once you could do NOR, again, you can build anything, right? Uh, here, we need, we're, we're kind of stuck with uh, implementing a NOT. But the good news is, NOT is not that hard. So if you remember the sense amplifier picture that we had, this is our sense amplifier. We have the value of the cell that we read over here, clearly in the bit line. But we have the complement on the other side, which means that we already have the knot, except it's not connected anywhere. Well, it's connected to the next subarray, actually, uh, but ignore that for now. The idea is basically to connect it back into the same subarray so that whenever you activate a row, you get the complement of the row, well, complement of the cell, uh, one of the cells in the row here in this case. And you basically take that complement and feed it back into a special row called a dual contact row. We call this the dual contact cell. Basically, it can take the data from the bit line bar over here, which is the other side of the sense amplifier, the complement value, and feed it back into the capacitor. That's the idea. Makes sense, right? Uh, I mean, you can, you can look at the operation of this, basically. Whenever you enable this n-word line, you get the data into the capacitor over here. Whenever you enable this d-word line, you actually read this dual context cell and you can store it anywhere else. So you can basically capture the result uh, of, a, of an activate, uh, the complement of the cell that you activated by enabling this n-word line after that. And then you can copy this particular capacitor, uh, the, the result that you captured essentially, to any other row in the uh, subarray by activating this and then activating uh, consecutively the destination row. So the idea is very simple. Feed the negated value in the sense amplifier into a special row. And this is this actually does whatever I said earlier. Uh, this is the initial state. Uh, this is bitwise not using a dual contact capacitor, as you can see. Uh, you basically read the source row, which amplifies the data, as you can see. It becomes VDD over here. This becomes zero. And then you enable the sense amplifier. Once you enable the sense amplifier, the data becomes uh, clearly zero. and uh, uh, wait a second, what did I do over here? Yeah, you enable the sense amplifier and then you enable uh, this, what we call this N word line while disabling uh, the source, which means that the data over here gets transferred into this dual contact cell capacitor. And from there you can copy with the row clone anywhere else in the subarray. That's the idea. Okay, you can read the paper for more detail. There's uh, simulations, spy simulations, et cetera of this. Now let's talk about performance, unless there are questions over here. So you can see that this is, a, this is basically exploiting basic chart sharing operations of the DM circuit, plus uh, the sense amplifier, clearly. And it works. Uh, uh, I mean, for this course, you don't need to know exactly how circuits work, but the basic circuit knowledge you can see here is just transistors, which we've covered also in digital design and computer architecture. But if you know about circuits, how circuits work, this actually works. And you can do the simulations, et cetera, which the paper does and shows that these actually work. Okay, now let's take a look at performance. There's performance evaluation in the paper. Clearly, you don't stop in terms of whether this works or not. Let's take, uh, you also look at how fast it is. And these are some operations in terms of the bandwidth or throughput in terms of giga operations per second of some processors. These are some real ones. Actually, HMC hybrid memory cube is a real one also. It's a 3D stacked memory where you have a logic layer underneath memory layers. And this logic layer can be reasonably fast and uh, you can have very high bandwidth access uh, to memory layers essentially. Uh, so this is going to be the fastest uh, real system because you have a logic layer underneath memory layers immediately. We're gonna talk more about that in the next lecture. Probably not today, we will see. Uh, and that logic layer can have very high bandwidth access to all of the bits uh, uh, in many banks in memory, let's say, I think uh, this, this paper assumes that you can have access to 64 banks and many subarrays. And then you can do bitwise operations uh, in them in the logic layer. You don't do it inside the DRAM, but you do it inside the logic layer that's tightly connected to DRAM. As a result, you can see that its throughput is very high. This white bar over here, I started with that bar. It's 128 giga uh, ends per second, let's say. Uh, and yeah, and you can see that its throughput is very high for all types of operations almost. So XOR, XNOR, NAN, NOR, it doesn't matter with H HMC because uh, it's over there. With AMBIT, it'll matter a little bit more. Okay, so Skylake is clearly the state-of-the-art Intel system at that time. Its throughput is essentially limited by the memory bandwidth, and you can see that. Uh, this is a GPU at the time, and its throughput also is limited by the memory bandwidth, as you can see. 
Uh, it's, if you look at Ambit, even without 3D, Ambit 3D is the idea that you have many banks. So you basically implement Ambit on uh, a 3D stacked architecture like looks like this, which enables you to have many, many banks, many more banks than a two-dimensional architecture, essentially. So let's look at Ambit as proposed. Uh, uh, and you can see that it outperforms even the hybrid memory cube significantly uh, on all of the operations. And you can ask me, for example, how do I do an AND NOR? Well, you basically do AND and NOT or or and NOT. How do I do XOR, XNOR? Now you actually do multiple of these NOT and AND operations to get XOR, XNOR. So basically you can build any sort of operation on top of AND and NOT, right? Or OR and NOT. Okay. Uh, so you can see that Ambit significantly improves. And if you actually enable Ambit to actually operate on many, many more banks and subarrays at the same time, your throughput actually is very high. You can see this is two giga uh, knots per second. And this is from 2015, 16 or so, basically. Even though the paper was published in 2017, the research was done much earlier, as you will see. Uh, we will see that when we talk about uh, 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 the type of pushback you can get when you have disruptive ideas like this. Okay, so hopefully this is uh, clear and this is uh, quite good as you can see, but let's take a look at the energy also because performance is only part of the uh, improvement. Energy is also improving in this case. Basically, this is uh, the energy of bitwise operations. You can see that not energy reduces by almost 60x compared to DDR3. And and or energy is also significantly reduced. Of course, as you build up, uh, you're doing more operations inside DM. You're doing more activates and more cloning, more row cloning. As a result, the energy benefits that you get compar uh, when, uh, compared to when you do not is reducing, but still 25x is quite high. And the energy is in terms of nanojoules per kilobyte, which is a good metric, I think. Okay, so this sounds good, I think. We are both improving performance and energy. And this is a summary of performance and energy, if you're interested, just compared to DDR3. And compared to DDR4, nothing changes much, actually. It's very similar. Uh, compared to high bandwidth memory and hybrid memory cube, actually energy is going to be even better. That's one of the reasons why we don't compare Ambit's energy because those implementations are very, very high energy to provide very high bandwidth. Ambit is much lower energy in the end. Okay, uh, so the next question of course is, okay, this is good at improving the energy and performance, but how can I take advantage of it in workloads? And that's the next thing that the paper evaluates and they that I'm going to talk about. As I mentioned, as long as you can translate your algorithm nicely to bot bitwise operations, any algorithm could be mapped. Of course, you need to do your data mapping nicely, uh, such that the data uh, that you're operating on gets into the same subarray. And to be able to do that, you need to do your mapping nicely. Plus, you may need to move data once in a while using row clones or the, in, in, uh, between banks. So in that sense, it's very synergistic with the row clone. You cannot do it, you cannot do Ambit without row clone in a general purpose manner, in my opinion. Uh, unless you're operating static data mapping and you're not changing your data mapping, which is not the case in many, many workloads in the end. But assume that you did your data mapping nicely for the, uh, basically you need to do your data mapping nicely uh, and assuming that you do that nicely and also uh, you change your algorithm nicely such that you can operate in a Bach bitwise manner, you can get a lot of benefit. Now, uh, there are a lot of works that can potentially benefit from it. Uh, some of them are here. Some of them are not here. In fact, you may have an algorithm in mind that could work. Uh, I'd recommend you think about it. It's, uh, it's a good direction, actually. Uh, but I will uh, point out a few uh, existing workloads that are heavily used that already do this. So for example, in databases, uh, bitmap indices are very commonly used. Essentially, you index a database using bitmaps, and there are a lot of bot bitwise operations you do. Some databases are designed to maximize bot bitwise operations, and that, that, that was done so that these databases can be excited on GPUs very well. Uh, and uh, those databases are a very good uh, uh, match for Ambit. Uh, Bitfunnel is a web search engine by Microsoft. You can read the respective papers over here. They design, they exa exactly have the same idea basically. Can we design our web search engine to maximize bot bitwise operations so that we can actually extract it on GPUs? And this is a good fit for Ambit. DNA sequence mapping, encryption set operations. Set operations are actually covered in the paper. You can take a look at them. So let's take a look at that bitmap index. Basically. Uh, bitmap index is an alternative to B-tree and its variants. It's good for performing range queries and joins. You can read about them. Uh, basically, it leads to many bitwise operations to perform a query. It's a way of representing an index into the database. For example, this is a very simple and let's say dumb bitwise index, uh, bit, bit, bitmap index to a database. You can imagine 
uh, let's say you have the records of all people in Switzerland or in the world, like that's a large database clearly, and you're basically classifying them in terms of age. Uh, and you set a bit in bitmap one, if the row or the person in that row's age is less than 18, you set uh, the bit in bitmap two, if the age is between these two values, you set an, uh, the bit in the bitmap three, if the age is between these values, and you set a bit here otherwise. So this is clearly a way of uh, representing uh, the value in the database. It's an index into the database. And the goal is to, in this case, accelerate age-based search, age-based queries, right? You could do this with any columns, if you will. You could basically turn any column into bitwise representations. And that accelerates the search clearly uh, of a query. This is already used in many databases to accelerate searches. Uh, and you can imagine basically how do you determine which columns to do this? Uh, I guess it depends on the queries you get. You can profile your database. You can profile uh, what kind of um, uh, benefits you would get if you actually represented things in terms of bitmaps and what kind of bin, bins do you need to create clearly, right? Here it's four bins, but maybe you need 60 bins. I don't know. Uh, so you need to think about that basically whenever you're doing bitmap indices to a database. Uh, but uh, if you do it right, it can be much faster than B-trees uh, to index into the databases. Okay, and you can read more about this in the Ambit papers, for example, there are a lot of references. So on top of this, you can execute a query using these bitmap indices, lots of bitwise operations. Uh, okay, what are the bitwise operations basically? Let's say I'm searching for people who are between ages 18 to 25, who go to ETH, uh, I don't know, who were born in Zurich uh, and who don't have COVID-19, <laughs> etc. And you search for all of them. Uh, and what are those? Those are essentially bitwise ands and ors uh, uh, in the end. Uh, so you get basically a lot of bitwise and and ors. You could potentially get nots also uh, if you're searching for people who are not, uh, uh, who are basically, uh, who are older than age 18, right? Uh, then you can not this one, uh, clearly. Uh, so you get a lot of bitwise operations if you actually do queries on bitmap indices. And we actually uh, did this. We actually ported a bitmap index-based database to on our simulator that simulates Ambit uh, faithfully end-to-end. -end. Uh, and these are the results in terms of end-to-end -end execution time of some queries. Uh, I mean, query is not written over here, but you can read the paper. Uh, you can see that end-to-end -end latency or execution time reduces significantly uh, from 5.4x to 6.66x, depending on the size of the data sets you have. And one good thing is as the size of the data set increases, clearly it increases here, you get better benefits. Right, you get higher performance improvements. So that's good because now you're actually using more inside your DRAM chip. And you can parallelize these queries also to some extent. As a result, you can use many DRAM chips at the same time. So this is very promising as you can see. In simulation, we get uh, five to six X, almost seven X performance improvement, right? We clearly, we didn't simulate more than four weeks, but I believe if you keep simulating, you get more benefits also. As your large, uh, data sets grow larger, it's not guaranteed that you will get larger performance, but uh, you can get larger performance as you can see over here. So this is another uh, simulation that was done. Basically, uh, this is the bit weaving uh, paper. Uh, this is basically a database that was uh, written by Jignesh Patel's group in 2013 with the goal of maximizing about bitwise operations. And we ported that database. We executed some queries in the simulator again, end to end. We looked at the end to end latency improvement, end to end speed up of a query. And again, you can see that overall, you get four to 12X performance improvement. Okay, there are some lower numbers over here, but those are for smaller databases. Normally you have much larger databases, which is really the interesting part, right? If you have a small database, yeah, maybe you don't care as much, but if you have a huge database, then that's where the data becomes a bigger bottleneck. So you can see that the performance improvements are increasing as the size of the database increases, both in terms of rows, as well as columns uh, or size of the column. Uh, at some point it saturates, of course, it's not uh, increasing dramatically because you're, you're fully utilizing uh, your internal memory bandwidth also uh, inside DRAM. So you can see that the results are quite promising uh, on end-to-end -end applications as well. So these applications are actually better than the row clone applications in my opinion, because these are end-to-end -end queries. Uh, and if you look at the Ambit paper, uh, it has more. Okay, uh, I guess I'm not going to go uh, more into Ambit, uh, but I'm happy to take questions if you're uh, interested. Uh, and we recently, if you're interested, you should read this paper. This could be another of the readings. I'm not sure if it'll be required, but 
I think it's a fun paper to read. Uh, hopefully it'll be even more fun after I give you the story. This is part of uh, my student Vivek Sashadri's thesis. He later joined Microsoft Research India as a, as a researcher, uh, as you can see over here. And we recently wrote this uh, book chapter together on India and Bot Bitwise Execution Engine uh, that describes, I think, Embit in a much nicer way, but also it has a very nice background section on DRAM. So if you're interested in a background on DRAM, unfortunately, there are, now, there are no great books and there are no uh, uh, simple uh, books that explain DRAM uh, in good detail. I think uh, the, the chapter two of this book chapter actually does a quite good job in terms of how DRAM operates in a simple and easy to understand way. Okay, so I think uh, the challenges, uh, I will pose this question, does memory have to be dumb? As you can see, row clone and ambit put some more intelligence into the memory device. And I think there's more intelligence to come. The question is of course, what should that be? And we, we may discuss that uh, uh, in a little bit. So clearly we're trying to minimize data movement in future architectures. Okay, let me give you a historical perspective on these two papers uh, and that we may be done early actually today. Uh, and a detour on the review process. We discussed the review process last time and it was very interesting for many of you. I'll discuss it a little bit more uh, clearly here. So, okay, my reaction is, okay, uh, Ambit and Roclone sound great, no? Well, uh, maybe not to everyone <laughs> initially. Okay, so let me give you a historical perspective for Roclone. Uh, before that, are there any pay, uh, questions? I hope the concepts are relatively clear. Okay, I don't see any questions. Again, feel free to ask interrupt me or ask it on chat. I will keep monitoring the chat while giving you the historical perspective. Okay, so Roclone is perhaps the first example of minimally changing DRAM chips to perform data movement and computation. I actually really like it clearly, but I'm also still surprised that it was done as late as 2013. It's very surprising to me. In fact, we found uh, while we were doing the work, we found some patents uh, that allude to uh, uh, copying data inside DRAM, but if you read the patents, they are too high level. They don't give you any mechanism at all. They say we can move data inside DRAM basically, and that's all you can get out of it after reading 60 pages of patent, let's say. <laughs> uh, and there are a lot of patents like that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so it's, it's really uh, uh, not uh, the idea we couldn't find anywhere. So clearly it led to a body of work uh, on NVM and NVM computation with small changes uh, and work building on Roclone still continues, but initially it was dismissed by some reviewers. Now this was lucky, it was rejected from only one conference. Uh, as you will see with Ambit, it was rejected from co four conferences before getting accepted. Uh, but let me give you the story of Roclone first. So why was it rejected? I think it's always good to know the reasons of why people reject. Some of them are fair, some of them are unfair. But you can see this, uh, this reviewer says, uh, the, the proposed technique is simple and elegant. It nicely exploits key circuit level characteristics of DRAM designs and minimize the changes necessary to come out of DRAM chips. This sounds good, right? And then the reviewer says, I found uh, the applicability uh, is uncompelling in terms of motivating the work and quantifying the benefit, especially coherence are glossed over, but in my opinion, critical. So this is actually uh, a, a not a valid concern because we actually uh, discussed that. Uh, there's also another comment by the CEO where I will show that and then I will go back and rebut this comment. But basically, uh, this is actually a comment that you may get, uh, especially if your idea is simple. And I think this is important to discuss because uh, wh when Vivek came up with the idea, I said that this is very simple. Has anyone done it? So let's do the due diligence and do the literature search. And then he and I and other uh, students actually did the literature search and we couldn't find the idea except for some patents which we cited in the paper. And as I, I already gave you the story of those patents, right? They're so high level that you cannot get a basic idea after reading 60 pages or so. Uh, so basically this reviewer uh, unfairly stated that the paper proposed a simple and not new idea uh, and, the, and blah, blah. Okay, you don't need to know more. This is, a, this is the part that's relevant, not new idea. Okay, this is the rebuttal that we wrote. The reviewer B mentions that our idea is not new and explicit reference by the reviewer would be helpful here. The saying basically the reviewer is unfair, right? Whenever you get a comment like this, you should always ask, okay, show me where it was done. <laughs> I did my due diligence. I searched uh, everywhere. I couldn't find it. And if, you, if you're calling it not new, show me where it was done. That's, that's a fair question to an unfair comment as you can see, right? And this is uh, a bit unfortunate. You can see that the uh, you is not being fair here or anybody reasonable would see that I think. Uh, Okay, uh, while the reviewer may be referring to one of the patents that we cite in our paper, citations 
five of these citations in the paper, these patterns are at a superficial level and do not provide a concrete mechanism. In contrast, we propose three concrete mechanisms and provide details on the most important architectural and microarchitectural modifications required at the DRAM chip, the memory controller, and the CPU to enable a system that supports the mechanisms. We also analyze their latency, hardware overhead, power, and performance in detail. We're not aware of any prior work that achieves this. I think this is a good rebuttal, but you can see that the paper is rejected. Uh, so it's very hard to overcome some of the initial gut feelings that reviewers have that are uh, likely biased, as you can see over here. So initially it was rejected from, you can see the submission, it was rejected from ISCA, right? Uh, and three is not a good, uh, three is weak reject, I think four is neutral. So it's basically, the reviewers decide to reject it, even though they found it to be novel. So that's unfortunate, clearly, right? It could have been published earlier. We, we wouldn't have wasted six months on it. Clearly the paper improved, but it didn't improve to the extent uh, that uh, something uh, fundamental has changed. We could have improved the paper anyway uh, to, for the final version, basically. Okay, uh, uh, now uh, clearly uh, these folks actually uh, question the applicability of the idea, right? Uh, yet there's a paper that appeared in ISCA 2015, which I mentioned earlier to you uh, in multiple times, actually. This is the Google paper that shows that uh, essentially half of the time, more than half of the time in their data center applications is spent waiting for memory. They also show this interesting graph over here. They basically analyze these, where they call it warehouse scale computing cycles, all of the data center workloads essentially. And they basically analyze what fraction of the cycles are spent on different components of data center tax. And data center tax includes some common operations like compression, memory allocation, hashing, uh, remote procedure calls, protobuf, the protocol buffers, hashing, well, I already said hashing, and memmo and memcopy also. You can see basically, it, they say, uh, we see common building blocks once we aggregate sampled profile data across many applications running in a data center. Uh, we quantify the performance impact of the data center tax and argue that its components are prime candidates for hardware acceleration in future data center system on chips. And you can see that they consume a significant fraction of uh, component. This is averaged over many, many softwares, according to Google, uh, all of the software that's running in their data centers. And you can see that this is across the same year, going from January to November. So I can see some updates have changed things. So I believe they say in the paper that uh, the Linux that they're running is updated over here. As a result, things have increased or some things have increased, not everything maybe. So, okay, this is an interesting paper and I, uh, I believe you're welcome to read it and we may actually assign it uh, as a reading also. But I would like to uh, look at this part because this, this part is, I think, very instructive uh, for, for multiple perspectives. One is, it essentially shows that uh, memmu and memcopy is occupying about 5% of the cycles. So you can see that we also tracked all calls to the memcopy and memmu library functions to estimate the amount of time spent on explicit data movement exposed to a simple API. There are clearly implicit data movement that's not exposed to that simple API. Uh, they're not accounting for it because they cannot instrument the code. They say this is a conservative estimate because it does not track inline uh, or explicit copies. This should be implicit copies, I think. I think there's a typo here. Uh, just the variance of these two library functions represent four to five percent of data center cycles. I think this is fascinating because only these two library functions actually occupy five to six percent of the data center cycles. And then they say recent work in performing data movement in DRAM, citing row clone, could optimize away this piece of text, which is really interesting, right? <laughs> Uh, basically, the reviewer saying, was saying, oh, I don't understand, it's uncompelling, there's not much benefit. And the paper gets published after this reviewer rejects it from one conference. And then these folks from Google, who have nothing really to do with us, basically say, uh, oh, this is a very good applicable direction. So you can see there's a big disconnect in terms of what type of uh, reviewer you get for your work. And whenever you're describing ideas, it's always good to understand what, who, who you're dealing with. Of course, if the reviewer is behind some uh, anonymity curtain, you cannot deal with them easily, right? If, they, they're, if they're not accountable for what they do and if they're anonymous uh, and if they're not reasonable, as you can see in some of the comments, then you have very little to do. So it's sad, but you try again, basically. You don't lose hope because you believe in the idea and uh, it gets accepted uh, if you're lucky in the next try, as you can see over here. And of course, the paper was written better as well over here, but fundamentally nothing has changed frankly, nothing fundamental has changed. Maybe we added one more workload. Basically these things should not be a, a deal breaker in terms of acceptance or rejection. Nothing we did between the two submissions 
uh, in my opinion, uh, warranted acceptance if the paper didn't warrant acceptance in the first place, in the first submission. But you can see that there you were, and, and there's some randomness as we discussed. You can potentially have random people evaluating your work. In this case, you can see that uh, the viewers all agree that it's positive. So five is strong accept, this is accept, and these are weak accepts. Okay, let me give you some more history. Hopefully this is interesting uh, because I think you will have to, whenever, if you're innovating in a field, and if you're especially disruptive, then you will need to deal with comments like this. And what is disruptive? Basically disruptive can be, okay, you change, basically you have an idea that's very simple. That could be disruptive, right? Uh, that changes something important. You have an idea that's very simple, but that requires many, many changes across the stack. And again, that could be disruptive, like Ambit is much more disruptive, right? It can actually uh, change the way applications are written, but it does require a lot of effort, clearly, to get to that stage. Uh, but you get resistance uh, with these uh, things. So let me give you my perspective of Ambit. This is the first work on performing bulk bitwise operations in DRAM by exploiting analog computation capability of bit lines. We have never seen any patent even on this topic. Now there are some patents uh, from uh, some, one Israeli company, uh, whose name I forget right now, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, interesting. We actually referenced that company in the, in the paper. You can take a look at it. Uh, but basically those patents do bulk bitwise operation in DRAM, but they add significant circuitry to the cell. So they don't do a chart sharing over here. Okay, uh, so it extends and completes the paper that was published before actually the uh, computer architecture letters paper that just does end and or, uh, end and, end and or, yes. It's disruptive because it spans algorithms to circuits and devices. So it's within the, the spirit of modern computer architectures. Because I, if you look at, if you call this disruptive, existing machine learning uh, accelerators are also disruptive and clearly they're disruptive, right? They span algorithms to circuits. So uh, it requires hardware software cooperation for adoption. Clearly that's true. And it led to a large amount of work and similar approaches in DRAM and NVM and the work continues to build. Initially it was dismissed by some reviewers. Uh, so it was rejected actually for four conferences. Uh, and I'm going to give you some examples of this. So it was rejected from ISCA 2016. I'm not going to go into the use of all of these, but I'm going to give you some highlights. It was rejected from MICRO 2016 afterwards. It was rejected from HPCA 2017 for very dubious reasons. It was really not clear to us why it was rejected. Uh, so uh, these reviews are actually positive, four positive reviews. And one person, I'm going to show you that review actually, rejected the paper with one with reasons that are really, really bad and there was no explanation from the program committee as to what, why it was rejected. So it shouldn't have been rejected here, but it was rejected, so what? Uh, and it was rejected from ISCA. So you can see that uh, in all cases, there are some reviewers who are positive and there are some cases, the reviewers who are strongly negative, maybe the same reviewer, who knows? And there are some reviewers who are in between also. So Ambit actually always had that uh, from the very beginning, uh, uh, you can see. Okay, clearly it sounds good, no, but uh, and you can see some of the reviews. This is a review from ISCA 2016, which it was rejected from the first time it was submitted. The reviewer says it's a very clever novel idea, great potential speed up energy efficiency gains. And the next weakness is unfortunately very bad, right? Probably won't ever be built. Not practical to assume DM manufacturers will, will change DM this way. That's a typo also, as you can see. So uh, let me go into the comments. Very interesting and novel, but, okay, this is the positive part. I found this idea very interesting and novel in particular, while there have been many works proposing moving computation closer to memory, I'm never aware of any work which proposed to leverage the DEM rows themselves to implement the computation. So I would accept this, right, if, if I were writing a comment like this. The benefits to this approach are large in that no actual logic is used to implement logical functions. Further, the operation occurs in parallel across the whole row, a huge degree of data parallelism. So very positive, but, okay, here's the subjective judgment. This will never get implemented. So the paper is rejected by this reviewer for that reason. Now I will let you judge the fairness of this, but I believe that this is completely unfair because this is something that the paper can do nothing about. <laughs> as you can see, right? We can propose the idea. We can do the best as we can do to evaluate it and clear the reviewer thinks that way. But the biggest problem with the work is that it underestimates the difficulty in modifying the process for benefit in only a subset of applications which do bulk bitwise operation. In particular, I find it hard to believe that the commodity DM industry will incorporate this into their DM standard process. DM process at this point, highly optimized, extreme to blah, blah, blah. Adding this kind of functionality will have a big impact on DM cost, blah, blah, even though we evaluate the DM cost. The performance benefit on the subset of applications isn't enough to justify the higher cost this will incur and this will never get implemented. You can see the last sentence over here. So you can see, you can get very strong reactions to a disruptive idea. Clearly, this reviewer thinks it's disruptive, 
but still goes ahead and rejects it, saying that this will never get implemented. That's a very strong claim, right? Uh, as, as a reviewer, I would question myself before writing something like this. Am I really doing the right thing? But clearly some people don't have that sort of self-control. Okay, uh, next thing is, uh, but, but again, uh, you can get reviews like this and there is no way to rebut them. We rebutted them and nothing has changed clearly. The paper was rejected from the conference. The only thing you can do is believe in your work, continue and do stronger work uh, and get it accepted and let history take the course. Because clearly this is unfair because if you're rejecting this uh, a work this way, you can reject any work that way. You can reject, for example, Intel MMX extensions, multimedia extensions, because there are not enough applications using MMX. Clearly MMX is old now, things have evolved to SSE, right? Uh, or AVX actually, not SSE anymore, AVX, advanced vector extensions. You can always reject uh, something by saying this will never get implemented. That's not uh, the function of a reviewer, right? The function of a reviewer can say, okay, this may be easy, harder to adopt. No question about that. But you cannot say, you, can, you cannot be a, a predictor of the future this strongly at least. Uh, so you're doing your use, so keep that in mind also. Uh, and actually, I'm going to show a later paper that shows that some of this is actually uh, possible in existing DRAM chips. Okay, uh, again, another reviewer says the same thing. It seems unlikely that something like this will be adopted, uh, even though they have very positive strengths over here. And they're actually nicer whenever they <laughs> say, they, they, don't, they don't say this will never get implemented. Okay, uh, positive. I'm not really convinced that any DRAM manufacturer would really consider modifying the DRAM in this way. It benefits blah, 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 blah. And actually they become stronger in the comments as you can see. It's not a, really a general purpose operation. It's not like the STL library would be changed to use this for its implementation of sets, who knows? So actually this sort of review is very harmful and very damaging, I think, uh, to uh, the scientific process because how do you know, right? This is very speculative, this is complete speculation. There is nothing uh, that's based on science or anything in the paper uh, that, any, uh, that, that, tri that should trigger this comment. It's very harmful for science because this enables people to reject ideas because they're not accountable and they can say anything they want, as you can see. And as a result, ideas get delayed. But also, I think if, if even if you truly believe this, uh, by 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 believe, by by uh, doing by writing this and rejecting works, you're actually ensuring that the work never sees the light of day. As a result, it's a self it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy, right? Meaning, uh, uh, okay, you don't know whether something will get implemented, but if it doesn't get exposed uh, in in literature, then you guarantee that something like that will not be implemented. Okay, another review from Iska. Uh, basically, this is actually a narrow-minded, uh, a horse type of person. I do not find architectural innovation over here. I'm not a circuits person. You go ahead and publish this in a circuits conference. And this is also very unfair because clearly there's a, a lot of architectural novelty in Ambit. It, stack, it spans algorithms to circuits, actually. There's a lot of ISA modifications that we discussed, etc. Clearly, those are ignored by the CEO saying that, oh, this should be, this is just circuits. And you will see the sort of folks also, and you'll need to be careful because whenever you do a disruptive work that spans across the stack, uh, you will get the sort of comments sometimes with, from unreasonable people, especially. Okay, let me talk about that review that uh, was reject uh, from HPCA also, even though all of the other reviewers were positive. I think it's good for people to see these. Uh, again, the similar comments basically. Seems like a new idea. It's sloppy review, as you can see, seems like. Uh, processing in memory ideas have researched. Okay, uh, sounds very, very sloppy as you can see, right? Uh, and the uh, reject reasons are here, weaknesses. Uh, impractical, too many implications on ISA, DRM design and coherence protocols, unlikely to benefit real world computations. Evaluation did not consider full program performance, which is incorrect actually. Uh, okay, I'm skeptical. You can read the rest on your own, if you will. But I, I actually, I should read this because this is really funny. Uh, you, you, you see that, you, you see how unfair some of these reviews can be. Okay, uh, maybe I'll read it. I've never seen, uh, I, I'm skeptical this would benefit real world computations. I've never seen real world program profiles with hot functions or instructions that are bitwise operations. Really, uh, bitmap indices, I've actually given uh, you some of them uh, in, this, in this course. But you see how unfair people can be if they're not accountable uh, over here. Uh, let's read this one because I think maybe some of you will laugh at it also. On the other hand, I have seen system profiles that show non-trivial time zeroing pages. I suggest retooling your work to support page zeroing and evaluating that with a full system simulation. Take a look at when, why the Linux kernel zeroes pages. You might be surprised at the possible impact. 
this is very funny for me because I think Rogue Clone does exactly this and there's very little value, in my opinion, to go through and doing this unless you're someone who wants to go and optimize Linux kernel, right? Basically, the server is extremely unfair in many, many dimensions, right? Basically, uh, they're, they're basically very sloppy in terms of how they pose the strengths. Uh, and they're actually very unfair uh, in terms of the evaluation of the practicality. Plus, uh, they're basically saying, don't do this work, go do some other work. <laughs> but that work is already done. <laughs> okay, I'll, li I'll leave you to be the judge. This is another review, you can take a look again. Uh, again, this is also uh, a lot of things and I will not bore you, uh, bore you with these, but you can actually look at these. But it's very similar uh, things. Things are interesting, uh, but um, the viewers are not able to get out of some mindset. If they're not unfair, even if they're not unfair, and some of these may or may not be unfair, but clearly this one's extremely unfair, you can see. Uh, some of the viewers are not able to get out of a, a mindset that they're used to. And you will get that if you're innovating. So, okay, you can see that their viewers are actually focusing on small, small things over here that can be corrected uh, with, uh, with changes to the paper as opposed to uh, rejecting it, basically. And essentially doing more simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, uh, ECC, the static direction open problem. I don't think anyone can solve that problem easily. So this would be an unfair thing and impact on DRM testing costs. Clearly anything you change DRM impacts DRM testing costs. So clearly there's a viewer accountability problem, as I mentioned multiple times. I'm going to stop here on, on this particular one. Uh, but in the end, we thank all of the viewers for their valuable plus unfair comments, as you can see, uh, whatever they are. But in the end, the work is accepted and started having its impact. We actually put an archive version before that. Uh, so other people have started referencing, we called it body RAM. Uh, before it was called Ambit. And we renamed it finally for the submission. Maybe the renaming that actually helped, uh, who knows. Uh, but basically we have a mindset issue and there are many similar examples from reviewers. And whenever you do innovate, you get this. And we're not even talking about industry standards bodies yet. The question is how do you fix this mindset problem? I believe we need to do more research, education, and implementation, alternative processing paradigms. And we need to be cognizant, I think, that people are not immediately embracing to disruptive ideas. Uh, so we need to really work on enabling the better future because I believe these ideas have their place. So I recommend this book, as I mentioned multiple times, you can take a look at it. I'm not gonna go through this, but we clearly need to fix the rear accountability problem. And just like main memory needs intelligent controllers, research community, and also community in general who's working on computer architecture needs accountable reviewers. As a result, I put these suggestions to reviewers, right? Be, be fair, you do not know it all, be open-minded, you do not know it all be accepting of different diverse, uh, diverse research methods, be constructive, not destructive, and do not have double standards. And you can see that, uh, uh, you can see why I wrote all of these, right, after seeing those reviews, hopefully. But okay, let me quickly take a few minutes to talk about what has been done to validate the results of row clone and bitwise operations that were rejected in the first place. This is work that was published in Micro 2019. Uh, four years after Roclon was published, oh no, six years after Roclon was published, uh, seven years after it was rejected almost, uh, and two years after Ambit was published, but really four years after uh, the first uh, bulk bitwise end and or, or published. And these folks, what they did was they actually took SoftMC, our infrastructure, and played with the timing parameters. And I think this is very nice. So what they did was, okay, this is copy from the paper, but I'm going to animate this. So what they did was basically they, uh, uh, you can ignore this, but it's easy to understand. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. What they did was they reduced the time between timing parameters. They did activate to a row, R1. They did a pre-charge. And then they did another activate immediately. So they basically reduced the timing parameters very, very little. They violated them. They didn't obey the timing parameters that you need to do. And this activate, um, the second activate, go to uh, different rows. So you can see that this pre-charge doesn't take effect actually. The second activate takes effect when, uh, when the bit line is higher than VDD over two, meaning that you still have the value of this first activate in the bit lines, which is essentially what row clone enables, right? Row clone is supposed to enable. So basically they're imitating row clone two consecutive activates by reducing the timing parameters so low that the second activate takes place while the first, act, uh, first row is still activated. That's the idea. And they show that this works in real DRM chips. I'm, not, I'm going to show that also. Uh, so uh, bitwise and, this is another example. Basically they show that they could do bitwise and. This is a bit more sophisticated, but similar way. Basically they, they activate row one. 
they pre-charge your one uh, and uh, sense amplifiers are not activated over here, blah, blah. Okay, you can read the paper for more detail. But while they're pre-charging, they start, uh, very, uh, you can see that they set these to zero. Uh, so they actually immediately send the commands very quickly to imitate uh, consecutive activations, uh, to, to imitate concurrent activations. And what happens is they actually activate row two very quickly. Now the time interval is so short that pre-charge cannot close R1. R3 also appears on the address bus because while you're changing the address from R1 to R2, you have to go through R3. You can see that this transition, but well, you don't have to, but it happens that you go through R3 over here. Uh, and essentially this mimics triple over activation on some DRM chips. So basically activate R2 will activate R3 and R2 at the same time. Plus R1 is also activated. You can, it's not closed in a very short amount of time. So even though the DRM chip is not designed for this, these folks figured out that you can do it in some DRM chips. And they used uh, the SoftMC infrastructure we have, they replicated it uh, uh, because we open sourced it as open source uh, software, as you know, and they do temperature, et cetera. This is their infrastructure built, built on our open source SoftMC. And they tested a bunch of chips from multiple manufacturers, as you can see over here, similar to what we have done. Uh, and uh, okay, they test the memory module. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. Uh, and basically they have some experimental methodology. They can do better, I think, in terms of this methodology, but they were able to show uh, by changing T1 and T2, they were able to show that uh, uh, they could successfully do row copy on all columns, for example, the, uh, for, for this uh, Alpida module, they could do row, row copy, row clone on all columns if they set the timing parameters to these values that are dark blue over here. True for this SK Hynix column, uh, SK Hynix. Uh, they could do row clone on this module for all columns uh, if they set the timing parameters accordingly like this, right? In fact, multiple timing parameters work over here. You can see that they can do AND and OR in all columns in this SK Hynix chips again, if they set the timing parameters to close to zero, time, the distances between the row one and row two activations. So that sounds good. And that's true for some of them also. So they can do reliably over here. Sometimes they cannot do it reliably, etc. But the proof of concept is that you can already do it almost in existing DRAM chips, right? So clearly you can do it in some DRAM chips. For some reason you cannot do it in all DRAM chips because you're really violating timing parameters. These chips are not even supposed to operate when you violate timing parameters, but clearly they're operating and they're giving you what we hypothesized, row copy as well as uh, ambit end and or operations, right? Granted, you cannot do it in all of the DRAM chips, but you're not supposed to do this anyway to begin with. So these chips are not designed for row clone or ambit, but even then you're getting benefits, right? Okay, uh, so this is actually very interesting. Uh, I think this is, a, this is probably the best answer you can give to unfair review where someone else goes and replicates your work and shows that you can actually do it in existing DRAM chips almost, right? Now imagine designing the DRAM for this purpose. Okay, so let me talk about this one. This one actually references some of our rejected works, earlier works, and basically shows that you can do it in uh, uh, phase change memory also, or non-volatile memory, basically, and row bitwise operations inside non-volatile memory in one step, and they look at different values of N and they show uh, significant performance benefits. Uh, and they show actually graph processing applications. I believe they show machine learning applications also. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop here, but uh, there are many other examples of why change it's working okay. Uh, maybe we'll start, uh, we'll, we'll cover this in one of the other lectures, but this, this mindset limits progress. There are many examples in real life. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll cover these uh, in some uh, other lectures uh, when we have time. Uh, if you're interested, remind me uh, the example of where to build a bridge on a river, because I think this is a cool story. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, if not, uh, feel free to ask them on Piazza. Uh, it'd be good to have more activity on Piazza. And uh, many folks were quite silent today. It'd be good to have more questions over here. Maybe I was very clear, or maybe the topic was not as controversial as some reviewers uh, uh, suggest that everybody should believe. Uh, but uh, please provide uh, uh, your questions and thinking, uh, and hopefully you will enjoy reading some of these uh, works also. But tomorrow we're going to continue uh, on uh, processing in memory, uh, computation in memory, and we're going to talk about 3D stacked memory especially. So until then, take care uh, and have a good evening.